Hello everybody, let's see what's going on. Yeah, let's see. Hello, I will making food, so I won't be chatting as much for now. Dan Freeman, you're making food and not sending me any. That's terrible. That is terrible. Oh, I should probably do that. Did you all hear that? Dan Freeman is making food and he's not sending us any. It's just, it's just cruel. Right, hello Peter Dawson. Hello John Shea. Hello Carl Van Gasberg. Hello Jess P. Hello Matthias Slavic. Hello DGB40. Hello Paul from, uh, from Chicago. I've been keenly looking forward to this presentation. Uh, that's slightly worrying. Hello Gino101. Hello Jack Hunter. Hello Anuk. Hello, Ian Carr. Hello, Not a Wolf. Hello, Osprey28, and thank you very much. That's very generous of you. Super chats, always gratefully, uh, uh, gratefully received. <laughs> Ryan, hello, Greg Sarsky. Hello, Felix B. Uh, Mike sounds like it's going. Let's see. Um, is that better? Is that better? So if I put that like that, is that getting better sound? Sorry, I've been moving stuff around in Malthus, but not quite a bit. Hello, Jamie Peter. Hello, Greg Salty. Hello, Felix B. And hello, everyone. How are you all doing tonight? Right, starters. Two things. Before I get started. I'm going to have a little bit of a discussion because um, in the UK recently, it seems there has been another set of young ladies. It's hissing. I wonder why it's hissing. Wonder if that's better. It shouldn't be hissing. It should have all the thresholds and everything in place. Hmm. Well, it, 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 all the registers are, it's okay, but I'm not sure why it would be sh uh, hissing. I don't know um, what would we cause it, honestly. So. Jamie Peter, I wonder how many ships have been named Osprey. HMS Osprey sounds like it should be some sort of carrier. It does sound like it should be some sort of carrier. We might look at that and say, young lady assisting? No. Uh, all right, do you know, there have been a, another, well, there's been a few issues in uh, the press recently, and I'm just going to quickly deal with them because, well, it's my fortune to come from quite a large family. And even if I didn't, I would probably still have the same views ingrained in me, thanks to my grandfather, if not my mother and my father. So, there have been a couple of girls recently who have been abducted, attacked, and there's one even being killed, unfortunately, in the UK. And I'm not going to... Current, frankly, that's not my place to get in. Um, it's a Naval History Channel. But there is something which I've seen going out there, which is a couple of students have been asking me because they know I'm old than them, of course. They know I don't drink, uh, but I do tend to, uh, I do go out occasionally when the past, when I was in university, etc., with groups of friends, etc. How did I deal with the scenario when I saw things going on in front of me? And my trick was what I called the Cousin Emily trick. Okay? Now, there's a reason I went for Cousin, and there's a reason I went for the front name Emily. Emily sounds nice. It just sounds something like nice, but it's also something which, it, it's, a, it's a soft name which someone can quickly grab into. And it also sounds like it could be a nickname for someone as well. So if, it's not, if they already know their name... Hmm. Anyway. So if... 
uh, if I saw a girl who was in, let's say, trouble in a bar, and then I saw some guys being overly aggressive or pushy, or a guy being overly aggressive or pushy, well, for starters, I have the fact that, in the nicest way, I'm not drinking, so I don't even have beer goggles to excuse me for letting that kind of behavior go in bars, and that's just rude in its first place. And I wouldn't do anyway. So my trick used to be to walk past and go, do a sort of, don't look now. Are you my cousin Emily? I haven't seen you in years. And basically the girl then has the choice. She can go, actually, I don't mind this guy, in which case she can go, no, I'm not your cousin. Or if they do want to, they go, oh, cousin. And there's then a problem for the guy, because if you are pretending to be boyfriend, your comp competition, brother, she should recognize you. But cousin, she might not recognize you at first glance, because you may, or, there's all sort of, but there's already automatically a consideration of a relationship which the guy has to deal with. And usually that caused the guy to back off. The couple of times it didn't, the guy then had a nasty accident with the floor. Um, I, I, it just came up and hit him. But that happens in life. The floors, they magically jump up and hit you when you're being rude to people. You just don't. So all I'm saying is, if you see it going on, don't rely on other people doing it because the odds are they'll rely on someone else to do it. You have to do it yourself. And you'll all have probably your own techniques and your own ideas. But in the end, if we want these things to be sorted out, we tend to need to get in there ourselves. Although I would say that in the case of some of my um, Scottish cousins, good luck to anyone who tries because they're all police officers and they tend to carry their batons. <clears throat> so good luck. Come on, guys, Paul from Chicago, Dr. Clark. Keynes is slightly worrying, but does it work economically? It does, actually. Did your spirit level make noise? It might do. <laughs> Jack I know USS Osprey was one of the few ships sunk by mines on 6th June 1944. Yes, I think that. Ah. Uh, Chen, uh, Chen, uh, 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 didn't, I'm sorry to hear that. Didn't they just arrest the police officer from that regard? No? Yes, they did. Jamie Peter, lol, bartender here. Can confirm, our souls get hit by flaws on occasion. Yes, it's amazing. Flaws are very violent things. Yes, I am waiting. When I get a bit older, it will, of course, transition into, are you my niece? But, um, yeah. Hello, Carl. Hello, Sean. Hello, Shumi. Hello, Carl. The doctor is being namist. <laughs> uh, yes. Uh, also, uh, the good thing about Emily is it tends to work across um, the ethnocultural sector uh, 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 scenario. Um, it's, yeah. <sighs> Do you know what I mean? Do we need to get the boys together and make Hunter kill? No. Or I, I have to admit, there are a couple of friends who we, um, uh, we used to get, we stopped meeting up in bars. We started meeting up in restaurants because almost every time we were in a bar, something happened. And we we're all going, we were, non, none of us are drinkers. Well, no. I tell a lie there. Uh, two of us do drink alcohol. Two, are, I don't, and the other two, two of the others don't. But um, they were they're sort of the types who have one pint of beer and they nurse it all evening. So I wouldn't really call them drinkers either. And so you would see what was going on around you, and oh, you've dropped something in that girl's drink. Uh, and would you like to drink that glass, sir? You seem to have claimed it. You don't want to drink that glass, do you, sir? Well, then I suggest you'll be giving the money to that young lady to get a new drink. Different times. These days, frankly, bar staff tend to be a lot more alert than they used to. 
Carmen, what's Bilge Pumps on this week? Uh, it's on the US Navy and how um, how they need to smart up their act, basically. <laughs> Hello, Bell and Aura. <laughs> come on, come on. Come on. USN ships, sorry, looks and then ages in the one half hours from two hours podcast. Uh, yeah, um, basically, that's what we're focusing on. But it's rather appropriate for this uh, this week because Lend Lease has a famous quote, which is about it, which is when your neighbor's house is on fire, you do not quibble over the cost of a hose. And that's Roosevelt who says that. And that's his famous selling point for the whole Lend Lease program. Well, here's this on a smaller level. When you see SHIT happening, it doesn't matter whether you see a single guy getting beaten up or a girl getting harassed or anything like that. The easiest way to say is to stand there and is to get is to actually go up and say, look, stop this. Because if enough people do go up and say stop it, they're gonna stop it. Because in my view, it's bullying. It's all variations of bullying. They are all... Mm. And it's just like Hitler and Mussolini and all those, they are bullies. That is it. You sta if enough people stand up to them, they run away scared. Or alternatively, if you're big enough like me, you can sit on them until the police turn up. Because, let's be honest, there isn't much that's just moving me. I weigh in... Roughly 90 kilograms. I'm six foot tall. There isn't, if I want to sit on you, there isn't much that's going to move me. And, it, it, you know, then that uh, requires usually a conversation with the, uh, with the lovely people who dress in blue, but, you know. Anuk, do they sell Iron Brew in a pub? Uh, they do in a couple of pubs, I know. I am going to be introducing Drac to one of the pubs in Surrey, which does do Iron Brew by <laughs> the pint. You can get draft Iron Brew. <laughs> you know, I usually leave Bill Trump, so when I'm on a big cycle, which I will need to do more of after, uh, I entered an 80-mile bike sport or, uh, drive this summer. Good luck, Jamie. Try to be. It's getting better, but sadly... Um, uh, we aren't at the point where it's safe to leave drinks totally unwatched. It makes me uh, a sad panda. Um, it makes me a very, very sad person. But that's the other reason um, my family and I like to drink Iron Brew. It's clearish, and it's bright orange. And if you add anything to it, it starts changing colour rapidly. <laughs> Kung Fu. Sit on them. Panda Star Kung Fu. Kung Fu Panda is one of my favorite video, uh, favorite movies ever. So yes, and I like the cartoons. And I know I'm in my thirties, and I admit this, but frankly, I don't care. So, lend lease. It's always fun. When you start talking about lend lease, it is something that is fun. The amount of people who go, but why do you need to do lend lease? What does it provide? It provides a lot. Mainly, it provides time. Because normally, the time taken, it's not so much the technological development. This is one of the interesting things about lend lease. Okay? The Americans estimate that Lend-Lease is incredibly attractive for them because under it, they get access to British technology, which cuts off their development time a lot. And the British get access to the American mass manufacturing, which cuts off the part of the cycle where you need to turn your very high-tech system into something you can mass produce. 
The British are capable of doing that, and they are doing that with certain things. But it's going to take time to work up to enough scale on the British level of industry within the Commonwealth. When you have the American scale um, alongside the Commonwealth scale working together, that takes it that much higher. So when we're talking about Lend-Lease, we often talk about it going one way. It actually goes both ways. Hello, De Filipino. And hello, Jeff Beeler. Gar Harmon, um, yes, but I will. Someday, if ever we are closer, uh, uh, we are in proximity, I will give you a few more ideas than that. <laughs> there are some slightly safer moves for you than that one. Um, Jay Peter, alternatively, ask Doorstar for assistance. Always good if they have them. Not as many bars and places in the UK have them as they should. Jeremy Tribbets, lend lease the thing that had no impact on the Eastern Front. Uh, well, that depends. If you're a Russian historian talking after World War II, yeah, you claim it has no impact. If you're Stalin talking during World War II, it has a massive impact. Steam White, work in the airport for hmm? one of our pilots flew recon in Air Force. Early first plane in, he flew ETO for US Army Air Course. Was the Spitfire? There was a lend lease going by both ways. Yes, here's the thing again, it's often forgotten. The US fly Spitfires, mosquitoes, they fly, fly lots of British aircraft, and then there's the amount of Merlin engines which are built in America, which are, of course are built by Packard, they're Packard Merlins, but they're the Merlin engine, which America takes very great advantage of. So you have this. Well, that is what Stalin says. Well, yeah, Stalin changes his mind. Jane Peter, iron brew pairs well with grouse for the drinkers. Hmm. Sure, mate. Also, the Americans get to have experience with building things and can learn lessons about what to do and what not to do. Oh, yeah, that helps. Jane Peter, the logistics behind Lend Lease are staggering. They are. And Jeff Beard, people often forget that then this included direct financial aid, which Truman cuts off in 1945 along with the military equipment aid. So as well, UK goes broke and has to sell off the farm. Um, uh, Truman doesn't so much uh, cut it off as uh, not renew it. And Britain doesn't so much go broke and have to sell up its farm, as have to deal with a government which comes in which has a different set of priorities. Because Attlee, whilst he's been a deputy prime minister for to Churchill throughout the war, the, co the National Coalition government, he is not, he doesn't have the same priorities as Churchill. Joe, starting question. Are we talking about idea based of British war production or does in the USA during World War I? Um, not yet. Not in this one. We might talk about that in another one. This one is slightly closer to the 1930s. Anuk, I just watched an interesting video by Tick on Soviet Logistics. Oh, cool. Andrew Campbell, rightio. That should make it easier to say my name. Thank you. I'm taking your bail in aura. <laughs> Inca. Uh, North American Mustang, ordered by UK, later Merlin, and I was affected by lease lend. <sighs> Kaham. Uh, hello, you got high power engine. That's reliable. Give me, please. Yeah. All work. Hmm. Jamie, the sad thing in history is most farms are morally indefensible at some point or other. No, we can agree. Empire, no. But, and you can say that actually Britain starts a transition to its Commonwealth quite a lot earlier than we might necessarily think. And it's one of those interesting things. If World War II doesn't happen, and Britain doesn't have to work up the armies in those nations as much as it has to do because of World War II, 
and so it can continue building the democratic institutions, it did want to get out of running them. Why? Because running a formal empire is incredibly expensive. Running a commonwealth, as was probably theorized by the likes of Churchill, etc., where everyone traded and Britain was the biggest trader in it and the most economically advanced, would be incredibly profitable because you would still have access to all those markets at preferential rates, but you wouldn't need to actually do the security or the administration of them. Don't, uh, I, I am a historian. I am cynical beyond belief. I really am. So when people tell me, ah, they are, yeah, they are decolonizing because it's the morally right thing to do, I go, yes. They also have, they've also been doing it for a while before then. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Churchill wants to save the empire and Labour wants to build up the people after six years of war. Churchill wanted to keep Nelson Romney for that example. Churchill... You have to remember actually, and this is the thing, Churchill commissioned all those reports which Labour acts off, and he Churchill wants to implement them slightly differently than Labour are planning, but he does... He does want to implement them. Uh, he wants to maintain more of a military than Labour necessarily does. But that's not necessarily a bad thing. And he didn't want to keep Nelson and Romney. He wanted to keep Nelson. No one was going to try and keep Romney. It was a floating wreck. It, his eight engines had been run into the ground. To keep Rodney post-World War II, you'd have basically had to build a new ship anyway, so you might as well build another vanguard. Come on, off topic. What do you make of the Scotland-Northern Ireland Tunnel? If it has a puns, it'll be interesting. I'm betting it'll be a rail tunnel if it does happen. It'll either be to Scotland or it'll be to Wales. There is another interesting idea out there which sees a Welsh, a Wales Northern Ireland tunnel going via the Isle of Man. Which is kind of an interesting idea. Ian Carl, UK still struggled to get advanced US technology during and from the war. Turbocharger and nuclear. Mm. Come, a prime access of those markets and denying Simon Sane. Yes, exactly. <laughs> so yes, you, you, you've got a decolonization process already going in terms of Britain. You've got Canada, Australia, Dominions are already pretty much independent. Um, you've got South Africa is heading that way. Rhodesia, we will not talk about too much because basically the real pro... One of the interesting things is Britain doesn't want to decolonize Rhodesia because they don't trust the people who are running Rhodesia at that point. They consider they don't like them. Um, they're worried about communist elements in India, which is one of the reasons why they want to be slow there. Um, Mainly because they want to have time for capitalist investment to take uh, to get in. Uh, you sit there and you go for and you go. Uh, yes, your plan is based on this. Britain was decolonizing already. Uh, that you can. Uh, there are lots of bits which are still considered part of the empire in 1939, which are pretty much self-governing. <laughs> Saves money. It's a lot cheaper that way. <sighs> and it was working quite well. It's one of the interesting things, again, if World War II hadn't happened. Or if World War II had happened five or six years later, been further along. Hitler would have been in real trouble then because the Commonwealth would have been far, far more independent and far more stronger. You would have had a far stronger Australian Navy, a far stronger Canadian Navy, far stronger armies, 
in all those things, South Africa would have started its rearmament program. You imagine South Africa with three or four cruisers and a flotilla of destroyers sitting down at the Cape. You imagine India with the same in the Indian Ocean. Then you imagine Australia, Canada, all having far larger forces than they did. It changes it, the balance. Instead of you having to build infrastructure from scratch and devote a lot of precious resources to building that infrastructure and building the initial naval cadres and army cadres and all those things, you can grow forces rather than having to massively expand, you can almost naturally grow the forces. It's a lot more economically cheaper. And a lot scarier for someone to take on. <laughs> Jim Peanut, a cynic is what a moralist calls a realist. To paraphrase, yes, Minister. Yep. Hello, Stafford. By the way, Stafford, welcome to the Killix. Uh, by the way, anyone who's not sure what the Killix are, in the Royal Navy terms, it's a nickname. It's the nickname for the leading seaman, and it's what they're often called more often than leading seaman. Uh, it's one of the things I, I, I would laugh if someone actually turns around and goes, oh, we need to change this name because it's, very, very, you know, it's it's got the phrase man in it, and we want to make this gender neutral. Um, I was actually, actually involved in an honest discussion which was going on, and the two people who technically had that rank in the room, well, on the, not in the room, on the Zoom call sort of thing, uh, both said, but were killicks. So... The thing is, it, basically, the Navy has the option of going, right then, we will just recognize Killick as the official name of this rank, and then no one can complain, because it's named after a um, knot on an anchor. Ah. That's for sure. The self government plan was planned in the 1840s. It started off a while. The Britain had been working at it for a while. They didn't want to run an empire. You have to remember, Britain is probably one of the most reluctant empire holders ever in history. Yes, they do have some people who go out and actively try and campaign to increase empire, but the vast majority really didn't want it. It was expensive. We'd have better things and more fun things to do with our money. Jimmy, could you imagine a post-Raj communist India? That puts fear in you. It, 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 that, that's what puts fear in a lot of people. Yes. Hold on. Third largest navy, uh, largest navy end of war. Add a true RCN battle force. Mm. Ian Carl, did Malaya have any forces planned? Yes, they did. Again. Uh, if you have World War One a couple years later, then the troops which would have been in Malaya would have trained up the local Malayan forces, and the forces which the Japanese would have been fighting would have been twice the strength they were, and would have been far better trained and far better equipped. Building up infrastructure itself kicks the economy. It does, yes. So let's look at some of the stuff which was rearmament, which was aiming for 1942, remember. Now there's HMS Formidable, ordered in March 1937, laid down in June 9th, laid down in June that year, launched August 1939, commissioned November 1940. I.e., she's actually launched the month before war begins, and it still takes over a year to get her through trials and commissioned. And they're trying to push that as hard and as fast as they can. The primary tank that the British Army has that's actually worth anything in 1939, the Matilda II. Usually outnumbered in vast majority by the Matilda Ones. And we have Singapore Naval Base. That there pictured in the 1950s, but it hadn't changed much in that time. 
And honestly, in 1939, Hurricanes were by far outnumbering Spitfires because they were far easier to produce and you were building a lot more of them. Well, let's consider some of the plans. Some of the plans, some of the earliest plans for the light fleet carriers, okay? When you're looking at them, and you're listening to the conversations about them based on Unicorn. The whole thing was the Royal Navy was going to have the fleet carriers, the illustrious class and indomitable class and Ark Royal and those sort of ships. But the light fleets, the things based on Unicorn, and remember they were talking about having a second, or a second Unicorn, possibly. They were going to be for the colonies. The Dominions. So there was an idea that Canada might buy a smaller carrier. Australia might buy a smaller carrier. New Zealand, South Africa. Again, you have to think that if war, these would have been ordered probably in about 1940-ish, if their plans had been going as they were planning, 1941-ish, Yes, there is the treaty, as we've been talking over. There's a 1936 Neil Arms Treaty. But that ceases really to have any impact by 1938. Everyone's pretty much ignoring that. So that means you have to think about 1940, 1941. We could have had Australia, Canada, as said, India or South Africa easily consider all joint ordering carry aircraft carriers. So, this is some of the background for Lend Lease. The fact is, the RN and the wider British forces have been focusing on being rearmed for 1942, still working on it because they were thinking they were going to have a war in the early to mid 1940s. They thought either Japan was gonna crack or Germany. They weren't sure which one was gonna go first, but they're pretty sure they were gonna to have to deal with it. This is what they're doing. Well, Unicorns are a uh, forward aviation support ship. The ships based off it are smaller carriers. Let's be honest about that one. Jeff Beeler, in 1939, Canada was not contemplating buying tanks, let alone aircraft carriers. I think tribals were the height of the RNCN's ambitions. They were, Jeff, they were the height of the RCN's ambitions. They weren't the height of the RN's ambitions for them. You have to remember that the RN was in many ways guiding the RCN, the RAN, and the RZ, the what eventually becomes the RNZN, and the Royal Indian Navy through their transformations, and the Royal South African Navy, and all these things. They are guiding them. So, in many ways, the, our Royal Navy has a template for where they want these to go, which the, the other navies don't really know they've got coming for them. So, officially, they will not tell their ministers they've got these plans, because their ministers don't want to spend that much money yet. But they are slow walking them into it. You're building tribal class destroyers. Well, that's good. That's lovely. Yes, tribal class destroyers are good. Ooh, they're really good. Next, you need a cruiser. Okay. That's what you need to order in 1940, a cruiser. 1941. Ooh. You want to do proceed? You want to do sea control? We've got to adjust the thing for you. You don't want a battleship. They're extortionate. They're really, really expensive. Take ages to book. But the latest thing is an aircraft carrier. Now, you don't want to spend the money on a full fleet aircraft carrier. That's expensive. But you want to have an aircraft carrier so you can say the status? Well, we've got the right thing for you. You see HMS Unicorn, our forward aviation and shield port ship. Well, we have a light fleet carrier based on her. You like? Australia's already ordering some. So it'll be cheap for you, because you'll just be going on the end of their build.
Garhamen, imagine how quick Germany would have rolled up in 1945 had they started the war then. Um, they would have certainly not have had a fun time in 1945. Anka, RN were not in the habit of spending a long time on commissioning cavalry ships, e.g. Prince of Wales and Victorious. No. They tried to get them through as quickly as they could. P. Dawson, Hurricane started production before Spitfires. They're actually delayed so that the Merlin could go in the fairy battles. Oh, yeah. Well, hard actually. War doesn't wait for plans. That's the annoying thing. That is the really annoying thing. You go to war with what you have, not with what you'd like to have. Come on, the A-13 was a good cruiser. The A-13 was a good cruiser. The trouble is most of the tanks taken in 1939 to France were A-9s, not A-13s. Well, they were more A-9s. At the outbreak of the Second World War, the Navy had 11 combat vessels, including 7 destroyers, 145 officers, and 1,674 men. Jeff, I'm not disagreeing with you. I'm not saying that the Canadian Navy isn't a lot further behind on the curve than the Royal Australian Navy. But the Royal Navy has a plan for them. <laughs> it might not be their plan for them, but they do have a plan for them, and they are trying to work on them. And Canada is coming round to it slowly. As I've been over there before, I've, I've talked about the various leaders of Canada and Australia in other videos, and manoeuvring them is not an easy thing. They are skilled politicians. You need to be careful. And again, Royal Navy understands that. Jeff Miller, in 1939, were the Light Fleet carriers on anyone's radar? Yes, the Royal Navy were already working on plans of them. The Royal Navy had been... Uh, uh, nicest way, HMS Unicorn gets ordered, and the next iteration of plans are all Light Fleet carriers. They are working on the Light Fleets. They're already working through the designs. So 19, uh, Unicorn is ordered from memory. I know when she's laid down, I'm just trying to remember if she's ordered in the same year and laid down in the same year, or she's ordered earlier. Unicorn is ordered in 1939. So, yeah. In 1930, she's ordered and she's laid down in 1939. 1939, the RN has plans for light fleet carriers going on. Hmm. Excellent. Yeah, I don't think Prince of Wales Victorious would have taken as long as they did, as they were not f the first of class, so were easier to push through. First of class take longer. Oh, they do. But it just went through quite quickly. A9 was okay, at least it had a punchy gun. Uh -huh. Jeff Hiller, the first Asama deploys with A10s and A13s, few A9s, other than close support versions. Your first armor does, yes. Uh, Andrew Campbell, the Crusader 3 was underrated, was a fine cruiser once the reliability was sorted and a six pounder fitted. Mm -hmm. Uh Admiral King had a plan for the Canadians too, it just wasn't the same plan. No. Dan Freeman, Jeff Beeler, out Dos Clark. My guess would be that one of the best ways to get the RCN to up to speed quickly is to point out that the RAN and RCN are ahead of them. Sean Mack, like I said, destroyers seem like enough when you don't have to think about fighting anything. Yeah. And if they don't back up their ideas, we'll suggest folding them into the uh, USN. Ooh, no, isn't that cruel? C1, so Atrus Audacity, a rebuilt captured German merchant ship led to the massive escort pro a massive escort pro carrier program. Um, Steam White. Atrus Audacity is the first uh, example in World War II of a merchant ship being converted to an aircraft carrier, yes, other than Mac ships. But honestly, there's been HMS Argus, Hermes, and Eagle wandering around since World War I. The Royal Navy has been practicing on the doctrine of escort carriers for a long time. They have an idea of what they need for an escort carrier. It's getting the funding to build it. 
And one of the interesting things, again, is that their tankers, which they've been building in peacetime, are so easy to convert to these various things. And a few of them do get done. <laughs> Inca, a lot of British armaments were lost in 1940 in the Battle of France. Yep. Replacement equipment was whatever could be produced quickly rather than new technology. Hence out of the date guns and tanks. Yes and no. Jeffrey, other than carrier aircraft and destroyer scouts, what does the Royal Navy get from then lease? Well, basically the cost of doing a lot of the building work on its ships when it goes to American yards. That's another reason to send them to American yards. Firstly, they have the space. Secondly, not landing craft, but as also as well, but they have it doesn't cost the British bank account. It gets charged in the American bill. Which is kind of useful. Considering they won't get charged as long as they get used to fight the enemy. Mm -hmm. Jane Peter, wasn't the plan if USA invaded Canada to abandon it and double down on India? No. The plan was to block the Panama Canal and ravage the eastern seaboard whilst bleeding any American Pacific fleet which tries to get around the other way. Basically, home fleet, go deal with the American Atlantic fleet. Um, South Atlantic squadron, go and watch down in the Falklands, because the Americans try to come around the South Atlantic. Good luck to them! Any ships which will survive will get engaged in the Caribbean. Uh, <laughs> that was the British plan. <laughs> the If they try and come around through Indian Ocean, well, hello, have you met the Mediterranean fleet? Hello, we're here. We're cute. We've reinforced the China and the East Indies squadrons. Now we look pretty. And we have the Australians and New Zealanders along with us for fun. Yeah. But no, the fall of Norway. That's a big thing that happens. Britain loses... Well, here's the thing. This is the first example of Britain's pre-war plans going completely too up. And I can say that completely fairly, because if you have to patrol the gap between Scotland and Norway, with the amount of aircraft with Coastal Command has, and the channel, you can do that quite easily. Yes, you'd want a few more aircraft, but you can start off doing it quite well. It's only when you lose Norway, and you therefore lose control of the other side of the North Sea, that you suddenly have the problems that the Germans can get into the Atlantic. Because, let's think about it this way. If you make all the submarines have to go out to the Atlantic the whole way underwater, rather than being able to operate from Norway or France, well, if they don't have to operate from Norway, that's a lot easier to protect. Uh, if we can think about the Arctic convoys, we can think about all the other things, but the fall of Norway is a big thing. It suddenly increases the sheer amount of supplies which Britain's going to need to fight this war. Fall of Norway takes the war up a level. And, of course, we do lose some stuff there as well. Not as much as we lose in France. Mostly, we managed to recover it quite well. Side note, the SN is looking at scale down America's and Ford's. 
Merely remind me of Unicorn and CVLs and CVs of World War II. Yeah. We won't get into those. Come on. Get, and can you get you to fix your ships without being uh, blooming bombed? Yeah, that does help. Jeff Elam, Canada did not care what the favorite Dominion Anzacs were up to. Mackenzie King was trying to do as little possible. I agree, but this is going to sound strange. Britain had, the Royal Navy had another card to play, which they were sort of starting to play with Canada, which was if you build up your Navy, you'll have the industry. We can send our ships to do maintenance and repair there, which will employ your people. And they are starting to use that in 1939 and 1938-39, which is what leads to the Canadian Tribal Order. So, yeah, they have some quid pro quo going with Mackenzie King. Yeah, remember, Mackenzie King is interested in Canada. If you can make the case that something benefit, will benefit Canada, it's viable. And also, he is a realist politically. Um, uh, being strong enough that he can deter America a bit on his own, that would be attractive to Mackenzie. You can argue the reason he isn't as keen on cruisers is he doesn't see them as a viable deterrent to the Americans. Whereas a carrier in cruisers, yeah, that could be a deterrent. Dan Free, my knowledge on Canadian politics are limited. It extends to someone killed the other arrow. That was a very bad time for everyone. Uh, Come, wouldn't the Far East and China's going to be saying hello? Oh, they would be, but you know, they'd be there. Mainly the Mediterranean fleet, though, is what's the big hello, because they got battleships. Hello. And aircraft carriers. Mm. Aren't we pretty? And they won't have sailed half as far as half as hard as, as the Americans do to get to Ceylon. Mm. Jim Peter, in the First World War, Indian reckons we only had 1,500 Brens left after Dunkirk. Uh, we needed that la land lease badly. Could the iron fuel itself out American oil? Yes. Huge fuel stores built up. Humongous. Stocked up nicely. American fuel was useful. It was. But you have to remember, Britain had huge fuel stores built around the world in its former coaling stations. They were built up in Ceylon, they were built up in Australia, they were built up in all over the place to keep things going. But that said, Norway is a big problem. Also of Norway. Mm hmm You'll all know I do that expansion thing because there are people who watch this on their phones and I like to pause. Jeff Beeler, the fall of France during the fall of Norway is a big hit, I think. I'm going to get to the fall of France, but I'm going to talk about the fall of Norway because actually, here's the thing. The fall of France is annoying. It really is annoying, the fall of France. It really is problematic. But I would always argue the fall of Norway is a far bigger problem for Britain in many respects. Because if the America if the Germans don't have Norway but they still manage to beat France, fine. You've still lost control of one side of the channel. But the channel is not really a good thing to try and exit in and out of. And if they fail to conquer Norway, then those iron supplies from Narvik, that iron ore isn't coming down. Uh, the fish, they're not getting the fish oil lubricants, which they need for their armaments industry. They are not getting a lot of... Cri Basically, Norway is one of those things where, uh, for Germany, it is a force enhancer, dramatically. Jane Peter, the first major bombing attacks on cities became possible with the fall of Norway. Aberdeen was out of the way, was one of the first hit. 
yeah. He came up and hit a, some Royal Navy ships in there. Just being a, Canada builds a Commonwealth air training plan big time and trains a lot of fleet air on. Yeah, that they do. Are we talking about Lend Lease or War Plan Red? Ooh, Lend Lease at the moment. But we have, have flocked in, uh, flicked into War Plan Red. Our numerous ships in 1914 Norway campaign. Yeah, they did. At one point, they lose 11 destroyers in 11 days. That's not a good time. That's for sure. Isn't the fuel stocks thing a, 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 a stocks the thing that Jackie Vish and Jellico absolutely push for? Yes. Prior to World War One and after World War One and prior to World War Two, as huge fuel stocks built up. Shemak, so the RM would say we will give you jobs, but only if you pay for a navy. Pretty much. Jane Peter, off topic, did the R Japanese try and capture the RM oil stores in these places? Why do you think Singapore was quite so attractive to them? Japanese operations, if they had, and Singapore, the, uh, the Brits do a fair good of, a job of damaging those supplies and making sure they're not, uh, there's a lot of them is destroyed, but there's still what there is very helpful to the Japanese. Sure. How much of the fall of France being annoying is having to deal with the Gaul on a regular basis? Oh. <sighs> Yeah, there are so many people they'd have preferred than the Gaul. Um, you lose France, you beef up Gibraltar and home fleet and just blockade it in with escorts. And then blockade Germany service ships and uh, Germany. Well, uh, the, the other trouble is Italy, but we'll get into that in a second. Not a wolf. The Allies did get the Norwegian Merchant Marine. How much effect was that? It was very useful. Uh, Norwegian Merchant Regime, um, Marine was one of, is one of the largest in the world at this point. It's incredibly useful getting Norwegian Merchant Marine. What would have been more useful would have been getting a Norway, which had beaten off a German invasion, was a solid ally for the rest of the war because of that, and also getting their Merchant Marine. So getting their, so they're getting their ores and all the other things, and not denying them to Germany, and getting their supplies, and being able to block off the uh, North Sea to the North Atlantic by having air patrols. Also, don't take this the wrong way, but imagine the British bomber force being based in southern Norway. Imagine that fun. Anyway, lots of Norway and, and France released the containment of a basically European war. So it can be argued as the true start of World War II, but I think invasion of Russia definitely pushed into a global event. Uh, no, we'll get into this in a bit later. Christian, if you took Namban and the Gaul and parked them on St. Helena, for the duration, how much better would things have been for the Allied High Command? Could we add Halifax? And then we'll be fine. <laughs> really, Halifax annoys me on many, many levels. He really does. <laughs> well, Carl Nowitz should room anyway has been put in charge of Norway as we've been over before. Um, Jane Peter, there wouldn't be any Berlin left not to be flippant about such human tragedy. No, but the, uh, the bomber force based in southern Norway would have been uh, a problematic experience for the Germans to deal with. Uh, Ian Carl, do you know Sweden considered interfering in Norway interesting campaign? They did. They basically, the you know, Swedes mobilized their own. Here's the thing. Here is the two examples of what happens. 
Denmark is invaded. Okay. The Swedes, radio message out. All reserves activate now. Arm the beaches. Everything is armed. We will... Re re everything is mobilized. Prepare all borders. Uh, man all forts. All ships to sea. Everything is ready. Norwegians. We don't want to risk, risk provoking the Germans. We will do it quietly by sending out a telegram. Norwegians get invaded. Sweden. Well, we don't know if any Germans were looking at the Swedish border. We do know if they had looked at the Swedish border, they'd have seen a lot of people with guns going, Hello, do you want to come in peace? Bomb force in Norway. You would have, you have an air bridge to Russia, and the northern convoys are safe. Yes. And the Filipino, the fall of France led bled the Luftwaffe and country to the RF, winning the, the, the uh, Battle of Berlin. Mm, Battle of Britain. Um, the they do. Uh, in as much the Battle of Britain is won. That does help, but honestly, if Britain had won, if we'd won in Norway, that would have helped as well. I think the Germans were also worried the Swedes would potentially close their mines permanently before the Germans could get close. Oh, you know the Swedes would do that. But also, let's be honest: taking on Sweden versus not taking on Norway. We know who are the who are the tougher fighters. We've all played uh, Empire Total War. Never fight the Swedes. So there's also this one. Italy joins the war. Isn't that nice? Yes. This is the Italian Empire. Oh, great. Yep. The Italians join the war. They do quickly swallow up British Somaliland and French Somaliland. Unfortunately, they then get those, lose those very quickly because the British come back and basically go, we were, we'd like our stuff back and we'll take your stuff as well. Hello, Manly 1640. It's, you know, you've got Norway's been lost and Italy joins the war. That's great for the Royal Navy, because here's the thing. You have to wonder if Norway doesn't get, if they win in Norway, does Italy join the war? Does Italy join the war in June 1940 if the Germans lose in Norway? Because if the Germans lose in Norway, are they as confident going into France? Is... Mussolini's confident going into France. It's a Hail Mary campaign, which honestly the Germans should have lost within 24 hours. Because, as I said, if the Norwegians had reacted like the Swedish, then the Germans would have arise to arrive to ha on the docks and gone, we're here to protect you from the British. You have guns and are shooting at us. Stop, stop. We're nice people. Stop killing us. Sorry about that, YouTube. But, you know, that is, that is the realistic thing. It, you know, the Norwegians have plenty of troops to defend their country. They have plenty of reserves to call up. Those reserves have very well-built positions. And as a, the Blucher will tell everyone, if those positions were manned, they could sink you. Not nice of them.
Can they can only, I'll say Norwegians can be stubborn. They might give up the formal fight, but they're always fighting in the background. Oh, I agree. But it's, it's in, as I say, this isn't Norway. This is the Norwegian government in 1940. It is not anything to be sure. It, it's literally the difference between the two governments. You've got Sweden, you've got Norway. And honestly, if Norway, if it had been the king, they'd have probably been, had their reserves activated by radio. But it's the Norwegian government are just, mm. Then a counterfactory type thing would be our favorite deranged mustachioed leader, uh, the right wing one. There are so many who weren't, who are. Um, have redirected forces from Norway if that was going badly away from France? Probably not. Norway was a Hail Mary, and reinforcing if things start going badly is going to be pretty much nine impossible. In car, Italy joins the war when they see France at death's door. Pretty much, yes. Carmen, to be fair, Sweden did have some tanks. I don't think Norway did. To be fair, the tanks the Germans land in Norway are not really tanks. Your impression of the Germans arriving in Norway brings to mind the wonderful Are We the Baddies sketch. That is true. You have to remember that Germans don't consider themselves the bad guys. They consider themselves going in to protect Germany, uh, you know, protect Norway from Britain and from its own communist-infused leaders. Uh, just like Britain feels that, you know, it's not capturing trade and capturing merchant ships, it's not commerce warfare, they are just putting them in British flags to protect them from being captured. John Shea, Britain sees Germany. Um, okay. Then sees Ge uh, Italy joins Germany. Oh, no. Yeah. And then Japan joins. Oh, come on. <laughs> that is pretty much. Britain's sort of going, okay, we are thinking we're going to have to fight one of these three, possibly two of them. All three? Goodness sake. Give us a break. <laughs> Um, I know my one friend still massively despises that government for what they've done and how they gave up a country so easily. Yes, and my classic example I point out is this. Quisling himself walks into the head of the police to ask him to get him turn to go and arrest the government, and the head of police kicks him out and tells him to stop being an idiot. There is plenty of fight in Norway. It's the government. Dan Freem, Norway had also sent away what they saw as their best general in the high, to the high north in case he was too provocative to the Germans. Yes, they did, and eventually, as I've as I said before, he ends up committing suicide because of their treatment of him. Uh, Jeff Beeler, Norway's like MacArthur in the Philippines, trying not to trigger people to invade them. Pretty much. It's not really tank country, to be honest, Greg's asking. Yes, it isn't, no. Um, sure, Mac. Unlike... Unlike Hoi Free, would la lead you to believe you can't roll over Norway with tanks and shatter a U.S. infantry corps in the mountains. Hmm. Come on, the clock. Uh, the Panzer II wasn't a bad light tank for the time, and I'd argue they were better than anything Norway had. Oh, I would, but Panzer IIs weren't necessarily the largest, the, 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 the most numerous vehicle they sent. They did actually send some... Pan uh, some not even Panzer ones, some test bed Panzers that were pre Panzer ones as well, long and they're frankly um John Luke, it is currently a weird country, yeah. Sure Mac, still salty about that three months later. <laughs> but 
Permanent. Hello, Permanent. Sweden had plans to invade in, uh, intervene in Norway and Denmark if the Germans had started to misbehave in late 1944-45. Yeah. Never count the Swedes out. They will invade you. Sweden, uh, uh, Dan Freeman, uh, deranged moustache leaders World War II era, uh, Stalin, uh, non moustache ones, Admiral King, General MacArthur, Mussolini, Dojo. Did he uh, have a moustache? Yeah, there's an option on that one. Permanent. Operation Rada Norge, uh, Operation Rada Denmark, yes. And I honestly believe that if Sweden had wanted to do, they would have won. Again, do you really want to fight the Swedes in, its, in a cold place, no matter how many troops you have? Besides, all the German troops are set up to resist someone coming from the sea. No, we, the Swedes would be coming over the mountains from behind them. They'd be sort of going, we are watching for the English. The English, the British will come. We are watching for the Britisher. We are watching for the Britisher. Click, click. Put your gun down. I'm your friendly Swedish person. Go on. I have just assembled a whole load of furniture, and you are now going to sit on it. <laughs> Sorry, I, I couldn't resist the IKEA voice. I'm sorry. I, I apologize to all Swedish people watching. Please don't hunt me down. I do like IKEA. Look, I, I'm using an IKEA blind for my office, and I have an IKEA curtain. I might be building my own shelves, but you know, hey ho. Don't hunt me down, IKEA assassins for Sweden. Uh, Jermak, full of France, a topic. Was taking over French aviation orders in the US a big thing, leading to land lease? Yes. Reading about a lot of US planes, there is a fragment ordered by France in 3940. Order was taken by UK. That, that, that quite a lot of, that's quite helpful for Britain, but it does cost Britain a lot of money. Dan Green, the Drakenfeld T-34 rule applies here. Except before the T-34 was invented. A World War One era tank in the face of no tanks could it would be uh, would be hard to stop until it uh, until it broke down. Not a wolf. Norway is one of those shake your head and throw your up your arms in frustration walk away moments. It really is. Frankly, Norway should have managed to defend itself. All the way back to the sinking of the fleet in Copenhagen, you had a straight choice: hand over your ships so your our enemy don't get them, or don't you want to know what ha you don't want to know what happens when you don't? Well, th that's been the British policy for a long time. Precisely, <laughs> Swedes will invade you. Grumbles in the 17th century, Poland, Lithuania. Eh, Sweden, you sound long arm. Hello, Ian Coombs. Hello, Ian. How are you doing? Dan Freeman, an IKEA flat pack tank. Don't joke. Ninka, Abba music in the background, potentially. Sean Mike, curtains are superior to blinds in every way. Change my mind. Uh, the blind goes down there and then it goes behind where I've put the camera mount. Um. Carmen, knowing the feelings of the, the, some Norwegians towards the Swedes after Norway having been part of Sweden, if Sweden was to save their country, it would be an interesting and they'd be very unhappy. Yes, they would be, but they'd be happier than being occupied by the Germans, and as the Swedes would probably not hang around to occupy them and let them get on with the merry business of torturing their quislings, their Norwegians probably wouldn't complain too much. They'd just be annoyed about it for the rest of history. Ah, uh, so sure. Hence von Blücher being about, uh, being about, he worked for Sweden in the 18th century. Yes. But every ship named after him has had a bad time. How you doing, Steve? Uh, Steven? Ian, I don't know. How you doing, Ian? By the way. See what? Lingenberry's jam. Sweden's secret weapon. Eh, it works. Switch water. Firing cannibals? Grape shot? Oh, meatballs. Mmm. Meatballs the size of cannibals. Oh. So you have the fall of France. And by the way, for anyone wondering, that little patch of yellow on the, one, on the map in the right is uh, what Italy gets of France after turning up so late. 
And then you have the French Empire. Which you can see is rather quite large. We have the troops evacuating from Dunkirk. And we have the Strasbourg being bomb, uh, being shelled during Melzer Pig and Melzer Kabir. The biggest problem with the fall of France is the Atlantic bases that the German Navy now gets. And the actually the loss of the equipment because the French, yes, their fleet included the burn. Yes, it was the burn. Yes, even some French admirals tried to pretend the burn doesn't exist. Yes. Even some of her own captains have tried to pretend the burn doesn't exist in their career. But still, they were ships, which could have been useful. And this is the other thing again. This is, these are your war plans. Your war plan, uh, the fall of Norway massively increases the amount of resources you need. The fall of France not only increases the resources you need, but decreases the resources you have available. That's a problem. Suddenly, Britain has to produce a Mediterranean fleet, a, for, a naval force in the Mediterranean, for the western half of the Mediterranean, which is why Force H suddenly appears in Gibraltar. That is the whole purpose of Force H. France has fallen. We need to actually be present in the western Mediterranean. That's been France's job. Okay, shall we call this the western Mediterranean fleet? Do you want to tell Cunningham he's only in charge of half Mediterranean? No, I don't. That would be painful for me. The screen would reach here. Yes. So what should you call it? Force H. Do we have an admiral available? Yes, we have a guy called Somerville, who until recently uh, well, had actually retired from the Navy due to illness, was called back to do light duty. We've had him down in Dunkirk for a while, uh, helping out with Dunkirk for a while, and Ramsey doing all that. Well, let's send him to Force H. Shall we give him a holiday first? No. This is what's going on with Britain at this point. John Luke, why why didn't we play, uh, pay the Swedes to misbehave? It would have been worth it. Germany gets some of the Napoleonic treatment, another little corporal having a fit about the British teasing them. Mm, honestly, the Swedish didn't want to get involved because they didn't like the, uh, the uh, Soviets that much. This is the thing. The Swedes would have got involved if they had to, but as they saw it, the two biggest threats to them, Germany and the Soviet Union, were beating seven kinds of mm, out of each other. That was good for the Swedes. <laughs> that meant they didn't have to do it. Dunkirk, Dutch clock. Lend lease is a fun subject because people don't understand how the economics involved. Yeah, it's a fun economics. Come, you could win a war with me over uh, Meeple's cannon. Just make the enemy too fat to fight. Mm. That's a shot. That's because Van Blucher, uh, Von Blucher took all luck. I mean, he got. Blatted at Ligny and lived for another five years at age 71. Yeah. Sean Mack. Hey, the burn is better than the Hermes for the Pacific, and that's all I care about. You want to take the burn that far away from port? You want to take it that far? The Hermes at least managed to go five minutes without breaking down. Engage a Where the four stack destroyers, which became the town class in RNZ, provide on lend lease, and how useful were they in comparison to the resource that they had to be put in refitting them? Actually, the four stack destroyers are a completely different separate agreement. Those 50 destroyers, um, we lose 11 destroyers in 11 days. And. They've got all the programs going to try and generate destroyers, but there's only so quickly they can be built. Um, there's only so quickly we can recondition the V and W destroyers. And so Roosevelt offers these, and in return, we give them 99 year lease bases and, and 99 year leases on all sorts of bases, and actually gift them bases in Newfoundland, etc. And that's the agreement for that. So basically, it's bases for ships and we get those 50 ships, and they're useful. 
we need the extra convoy escorts. Mainly because we're too busy pummeling everything. Um, during Russia, is it true the US threatened to attack our fleet during service? No. Shumak, Britain was so short of admirals, how much would they have been uh, paid to be loaned a US admiral? Um, actually, Britain wasn't as short of admirals as it sometimes acts like it is. It did lose a lot of good ones, and it is panicking a bit. But they very quickly settle down and start producing them and getting them very quickly. And they go straight off to the go, they go which officers automatically have force command experience. And pretty much every senior captain who has commanded destroyer flotillas gets promoted to rear admiral or commodore within like a few minutes. And all the ones which are currently in command of them are under close watch. And that is another reason why you have destroyer officers start to dominate the Royal Navy by the end of the Second World War. It's, it's not because of anything nefarious or any kind of plan. It's literally, we need officers who are used to coordinating ships and coordinating groups and thinking about groups. And if you come up the cruiser route, um, the point at which you start to thinking about coordinating other, with other ships is when you're, in, when you're the captain of a ship or the flag captain of the cruiser squadron, which will be commanded by a rear admiral, etc., or maybe a commodore if it's a, if it's a small squadron in the South Atlantic. But if you're talking about destroyers, well, they're often commanded by lieutenant commanders. There's often a divisional leader who's a commander, and there's a flotilla leader who's a captain. So there are two officers who have to start thinking, at least two officers there, who are going to be thinking about how to coordinate other group, other ships. And sometimes you have not, and that's if you're a tribal, which is eight ships in a flotilla. If you're a regular destroyer flotilla, you'll have at least two commanders, at least, because there'll be nine ships, there'll be a captain and a destroyer leader, there'll be two commanders, each with their own division. Or sometimes three, because they'll divide into three, and they'll have six lieutenant commanders. So, you, you start to realize that the Royal Navy, it, it, it has a reason. It has not only, that's the good thing about destroyers at this point. They give command to junior officers, and they also give command to slightly more senior officers. Sure, Mark. How furious would they have been if they gave the US gave them King? If the US gave the Royal Navy King, that would have been fun. King would have suddenly had to go from being gone from being anti Britain to being pro Britain because he's fighting for them. And could have seen us actually invade America. Thinking about King. Um, Carmen, shall we give him a holiday? Nah, he can have a permanent one once they kick the Italians. Yeah. Inca, have the US still got lend arrangements for bases? Um, there are still some very interesting agreements in place for various bases and facilities. Dan to what extent were the admirals of the ports, e.g. Admiral James at Portsmouth, out to pasture and to what extent useful? useful. They're often area commands. So if you consider Portsmouth would have a section of the channel that, he, that they're responsible for. And because of the sheer amount of traffic and the importance of the anti-invasion preparations, that was actually quite an intensive command. And they're also, they're usually looking after key ports and key areas, which they have to keep going. So... They're coordinating minesweepers, they're coordinating coastal patrols, attack on their reciprocal areas of France or enemy-held coast. You know, they're, they're doing quite a lot of work. Peter Dawson, those 50 destroyers were so useful, we exported them, one, Educantan to the Germans. Well, you know, by the time she's used for that, we have other destroyers coming online and we can afford to think about that for older ships. Carmen, have the RN got many good admirals these days? Yes, they've got a fair number of good ones. 
Jim Peter, destroyers act like the frigates did in the Age of Sail for our own officer training. Yeah, pretty much. Darren Thatcher, what if question for you from a War of 1812 Constitution versus Chen? Who would win? Ooh. Who gets the first shots? That's it, basically. They are fairly capable little ships. They're fairly capable ships, so, you know. It's wind and luck. But um, usually on the what-if questions, usually I do those more on brew ships on Sunday. Usually these are sort of the lectures. But quick ones I'll answer. Um, <sighs> Inca, Britain does far better for competent admirals than it does for generals. And that it does. Uh, John Luke, Force H stands for how do 15 inch shells taste former friends and anyone else who wants to taste? Eh, yeah. Dear friend, why was Phillips given command of Task Force Z in Singapore? The guy had much experience, not even in World War I. He was the senior admiral, and he was an experienced admiral. He was the admiral available. And he was, he understand he understood new technology. He was well worked up. He written a provisional plan, which basically was Churchill sending us out here with battleships. We don't want to go on battleships, but we're going to have to go because that's what he wants. So right then, what we need is that we need these two cattle ships. We need at least an aircraft carrier. I think he wanted uh, two heavy cruisers, three large light cruisers. Uh, in, and two AA cruisers as his force, plus three flotillas of destroyers, and that was the force he was talking about sending, and of course he just gets half a flotilla of destroyers, broadly speaking, and a couple of, ca a couple of cowboy ships, because that's what's available. Because when the force is written up, the uh, plan's written up, Britain actually has three more, well, two more um, carriers than it does by the time it's executed. He was being set up to run the war in the Far East of British. He'd be number two in the Admiralty since before the war. Well, not so much number two as he was, um, how do I put it? Um, deputy. Commander-in-Chief. Deputy, uh, you know, a first Sea Lord's assistant. He'd done a lot of work. Right, what have we got coming up? Uh, what am I announcing today? Uh, we've got the Battle of Saints on the 9th of April. That's going to be a fun one. That's going to be alive. And we've got Brew Ships 44, something medieval. And Brew Ships 43 is going to be aircraft carriers and naval aviation, because I fancy going through that again, because I've had some more books. And 13th April is K-Class Submarines. Because it's 13th of April. So that's what we've got coming up. And, of course, on Sunday, we have Brew Ships 41, A History of Armour and Phoebe's Warfare. Where I'm hoping... I'm hoping I, uh, that I might be able to get some, borrow something to make that far cooler. Will you ask what I'm checking? Just seeing if a message had come through on my phone. <laughs> Being rude, I know. So, what's going on in the USA? Well, first off, please remember, it, the Lend-Lease is not just for Britain. It's not just for Britain. It's China and Greece get it as well. So, That's a fun thing, and that kind of puts another spin on the, all the things with Japan, because uh, you're not just taking fuel off them and banning exports, you're actually actively arming the people they're fighting. And you still don't expect to get attacked. Oh, I do not know. 
Right then, so here's a quote from No Ordinary Time, Franklin and Eleanor Roosevelt, The Home Front of World War II. Now, I'd point out that Harry Lloyd Hopkins actually ends up living in the White House for three years. He's one of the key people to work with Roosevelt and Churchill, and he's almost more important to that relationship than their frequent chattings. Um, right, so, at the welcoming dinner in his honor, the story is told Churchill, knowing that Hopkins was a social worker with no military background, deliberately directed the conversation to issues of economic and social reform, emphasizing that after war he planned to modernize Britain's slum or cottages with electricity and plumbing. I, I don't think he'd have said the phrase slum cottages, but hey ho. Mr. Churchill, Hopkins interrupted, I don't give a damn about your cottages. I've come here to find out how we can help you beat this fellow Hitler. When he heard this, Churchill's face lit up. He strained his shoulders and he got up from the table. Mr. Hopkins, come with me, he said, leading Hopkins to his study. For the next four hours, Churchill confided the entire direction of his nation's affairs to the President's envoy. And from this hour, Churchill wrote in his memoirs, began a friendship between us which sailed serenely over all earthquakes and convulsions. He was the most faithful and perfect channel of communication between the president and me. There he sat, slim, frail, ill, but absolutely glowing with a fine comprehension of the cause. It was to be the defeat, ruin, and slaughter of Hitler. To the exclusion of all other purposes, loyalties or aims, he was a crumbling lighthouse from which there shone the beams that led great fleets to harbor. And um, please note, don't take this the wrong way, but you can tell this book's written by an American because they use England to describe the whole of Britain when they and then they say they're visiting Scotland. So, you know, it's Britain, okay? It's Britain. It's the United Kingdoms of Great Britain. They're England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, all in there, the United Kingdoms of Great Britain. All that. Usually just called Great Britain or Britain if you're being less massively patriotic. It's not England. England is one part of it. I'm from England. Well, no, my family's from all over it, but you know, technically I, I'm born and raised in England. While Hopkins was in England, he spent almost every waking hour with Churchill, journeying with him to Scapa Flow, Scotland, definitely not in England then, uh, dining together night after night, relaxing at Chequers, Churchill's country home, not Churchill's country home, the Prime Minister's country estate. Churchill's country home is somewhere called Chartwell. It's very different. Proximity to the great man had its effect. Hopkins became an ardent admirer of Churchill, an absolute partisan of Britain's cause. At a small dinner party one evening, Hopkins rose to his feet. I suppose you wish to know what I'm going to say to President Roosevelt on my return. Well, I'm going to quote you one verse from that book of books. Whither thou goest, I will go, and where thou lodgest, I will lodge. Thy people shall be my people, and thy God my God. Then in his own words he added, even to the end. When Hopkins sat down, Churchill's doctor, Lord Moran, looked over at Churchill and saw tears streaming down his face. Ah. <sighs> Well, isn't that nice? Uh, let's see. Uh, got a question coming from Carmen. If there's any tank books you want, I've got a couple I could lend for it as a suggestion. As suggested, it. I have some ideas. Don't worry, I'm fine on tank books. Uh, Trent Lanko, Dr. Clark. One of the more interesting things about lend lease was how the USA shipped. But thanks for the offer, Carl. Uh, shipped intermediate products to UK and USA to get weapons. Also provided 114 radars with USA vacuum tubes. Yes. Trent Lincoln, a similar game was played in the UK as the US Army used uh, UK one and a half and, and two meter radars that were made with US vacuum tubes. Hmm. Jim Peter, all this traffic, uh, traffic of lend lease materials must have seemed like a silver lining to the prospect of being a civilian merchant shipping company at the time when you could lose a ship taking a US contract. Mm hmm. It's fun times. Take care, Jespy.
Inca. Ambassador Joe Kennedy was giving a very negative view of the ability of the UK even to survive at this time. Um, as Roosevelt put it on Joe Kennedy, uh, Joe's was would have been happier. Uh, well, I feel that a small capitalist class would have been better protected under a Hitler than under a Churchill. Um, Joe was very not very pro-British in any way, stretch of imagination. And Avinda, were China and Greece forced to pay the US back? Was Britain forced to pay the US back? Or did we pay the US back for, another, for other things? Jim Peter, Great Britain is the expression of the Treaties of the Union. Yeah. Which then be passed after other parts of Britain went bankrupt. Grossati, somehow I think that memoir has a bit of invention in it. Oh, just a tad. It's rather cute. Joe Villa, by this time, Joe Kennedy is no longer ambassador and really out of politics. He's not out of politics as much as Joe Roosevelt would have liked him to be. He likes to go visit Roosevelt and demand entry on occasion. And Roosevelt, because Joe Kennedy is such a senior Democratic fixer, has to let him in. He doesn't like him, though. Jim Peter. We're paying them back because it was the proper uh, fiscal thing to do. A state that doesn't honor its debts is a failed state. Yes, but we don't technically fail them, pay them back for lend lease. Okay? There are reasons for this, and we'll get into lend lease as we go in. <laughs> So, here is some more about its origin development. This is from a journal article, uh, Lend Lease's Origin Development, Part 1, uh, author DPE, I couldn't find the full name, in the Bulletin of International News, published January the 20th, 1945. Although the US government had by now recognized that the defeat of Great Britain was a vital, uh, the defense of Great Britain was vital of, uh, to the defense of America, the law of cash and carry still held good and presented problems. During the summer of 1940, Great Britain's shipping difficulties had been greatly intensified by her severe naval losses. And in September 1940, the United States, in order to assist in protection of Great Britain's supply line and also to obtain protection for her own Atlantic approaches, turned over to Great Britain 50 overage destroyers in exchange for a 99-year lease on site of sites for American bases in the Bahamas, Jamaica, St. Lucia, Trinidad, Antigua, and British Guinea. While at the same time, the United States was given freely a similar lease for bases in Bermuda and Newfoundland, which would also be useful to Canada. Basically, America built these bases up and they were good to protect Canada and not various other British other colonies as well. But the security of the Atlantic was not the only problem of cash and carry. For as a result of the huge orders placed by Great Britain in 1940, the question of her dollar resources had become excuse, acute. Great Britain had started in September 1939 with 4.5 billion in dollars, or four and a half thousand million in dollars, and gold, and United States investments that could be turned into dollars, including private dollar balances and also private investments, which after the outbreak of war were taken over by the government, compensation being paid to the owners in British pounds. From sales of gold, exports, and other sources, over $2,000 million, or $2 billion, were gradually added. But by December 1940, little more than this latter amount was left, and of this, nearly one and a half thousand million, or 1.5 billion, was ple were pledged for orders already placed. Therefore, basically, Britain has $500 million left for orders. Faced with an acute shortage of dollars, Great Britain was forced to slow up her orders, and some new solution had to be found. The problem could, of course, have been met by loans from the United States, as in the last war, 
But the previous unhappy experience of war debts and their consequences caused fear that the new fixed war loans might only create once more the same insoluble post-war economic problems and difficulties. Instead, President Roosevelt proposed Lend-Lease, behind which lay the idea that if the United States, while training and equipping large forces of her own, at the same time, leased arms to the British Empire, she would thus have, uh, have additional protection. The solution of the problem was first announced on December the 17th, 1940, at a press conference. The president said that if your neighbor's house is on fire, you don't open negotiations to sell him your hose pipe. You lend it to him, and he returns it to you afterwards and pays you for any damage done to it. He advised the same policy as regards American armaments, and explained that his objective was to eliminate the dollar sign. Throughout the United States, this novel proposal aroused fierce controversy, but after much debate, it was finally approved by Congress. One of the most fiercest critics of it was actually Mr. Kennedy, who, let's say, was pro the other side. This act of March 1941, which was extended in March 1943, and again on May the 17th, 1944, to cover the period up to July 1945, is entitled An Act to Promote the Defense of the United States. It empowers the president to authorize the relevant government department or agency to sell, transfer, title to, exchange, lease, lend, or otherwise dispose of any defense article to any country whose defense he deems vital to the defense of the United States. It also provides for the repair and recondition of defense articles for such countries and for the communication to them of information concerning defense articles. Terms and conditions upon which any foreign government was to receive aid were deliberately left very broad, for the act states they shall be those which the president deems satisfactory, and the benefit to the United States may be payment or repayment in kind, or property, or any other direct or indirect benefit which the president seems satisfactory. In effect, the act brought to end difficulty of the British government. So as you can see, Lend-Lease is not about money. It is about economics, but not about money. Okay, it's about Britain's running out of cash to do the cash and carry orders. And that's a problem. Because it's far cheaper in, Amer in men and material for a Britain to be fighting the war than America to. So it's far cheaper for Britain and America to supply the weapons to Britain than to have to fight the war herself. In car, interesting why Roosevelt had sent UK Kennedy to the UK in the first instance. Get rid of him. Don't forget, read Destroyers of Aces, 1990 releases issued under the dress. Cough, cough, Hong Kong, cough. Mm. Don't forget, when was Joe Kennedy appointed as ambassador? Was it a prestigious uh, but low risk posting at the time to get rid of Kennedy out of the resort's hair? Pretty much, and uh, let's see, Joe Kennedy, he's broke the UK. I'm trying to remember the exact dates. <laughs> Uh, he's ambassador to the United Kingdom, and he's there March 1938 to October 1940. And in November 1940, during the Battle of Britain, Kennedy publicly stated, democracy is finished in England. It may be here in the United, it may be here in the United States. And after that, he's basically resigned. Uh, yeah, he isn't a fun character to deal with, Kennedy. Uh, uh, mm. Jane Vino, such a brilliant tragedy. What an affecting speech. Mm. It works well. Jaron Fatcher, US criticized the UK Empire at the time. Yet yeah, they had an empire in the Philippines themselves. Geriant! You aren't presuming that people can't be hypocrites on the international stage. We think politics are hypocr uh, politicians can be hypocritical enough on the domestic stage. On the international stage, they can be barefaced. Mm. It's great. There's far less people around to point out what they're, what they're doing is wrong. 
Carmen, one way to sell it to her is to look, is, uh, look, no other American lives are at risk and paying her it now is a, a good option. Actually, that is one of the things they ask Churchill to emphasize in his global speeches, that the safest way for America to stay out of the war is for Britain to fight the war. Because if Britain loses, then the next thing America's going to have to deal with is a Germany armed with the Royal Navy and all the armaments of Britain that's going to be looking at them. So that's the threat, basically. Do you want the German army combined with the Royal Navy looking at you? No? Um, yes. Well, you know. Shumak, the way you are describing it, the US had a favorite and was finding excuses to give them stuff, which doesn't seem very neutral to the US. Wait until we get to the last one, the last, uh, the last slides. Andrew Cameron, give us the tools and we shall finish the job springs of mind. Yep. DP Ettinger, do I start it? Thank you. Right then, so let's look at the Lend-Lease Act itself. The bill. Further to promote the defense of the United States and for other purposes. Being enacted by the Senate and House of Representatives of the United States of America in Congress assembled, that this act may be cited as an act to promote the defense of the United States. Sec 2. As used in this article, the term defense article means, one, any weapon, munition, aircraft, vessel, or boat. Two, any machinery, facility, tool, material, or support ne supply necessary for the manufacture, production, processing, repair, servicing, or operation of any article described in this uh, subsection. Three, any component, material, or part of any equipment for any article described in this subsection. Four, any agricultural, industrial, or other commodity or article for defense. <laughs> is it me or is that rather broad? That is very broad, isn't it? Such term, defense article, includes any article described in this subsection, manufactured or procured a pursuant to section 3, or to which the United States or any foreign government has or hereafter acquires title, possession, or control. B, the term defense information means any plan, specification, design, prototype, or information pertaining to any defense article. Section 3A, notwithstanding provisions of any other law, the President may, from time to time, when he deems it in the interest of national defense, authorize the Secretary of War, the Secretary of the Navy, or the head of any department or agency of the government, one, to manufacture in arsenals, factories, and shipyards under their jurisdiction or otherwise procure to the extent to which funds are made available, therefore, or contracts are authorized from time to time by Congress or both, any defense articles for the government or of any country whose defense the president deems vital to the defense of the United States. Well, hey. To sell, transfer, title to exchange, lease, lend, or otherwise dispose of to any such government, any defense article, but not no defense article not manufactured or procured under paragraph one shall in any way be disposed of under the paragraphs except after consultation with the Chief of Staff of the Army or Chief of Naval Operations of the Navy or both. The value of defense articles disposed of in any way under the authority of this paragraph and procured from funds herefore appropriate shall not exceed 1.3 billion. The value of such defense articles shall be determined by the head of the department of the or agency concerned or such other department, agency, or officer as shall be designated in the manner provided in the rules and regulations issued hereunder. Defense articles procured from funds hereafter appropriate to any defense or agency of the government other than from funds authorized to be appropriated under this act shall not be disposed of in any way under authority of this paragraph except to the extent hereafter authorized by Congress in the acts authorizing such funds or otherwise. Three, test, inspect, prove, repair, outfit, recondition, or otherwise to place in good working order to the extent to which funds are made available, therefore, or contracts are authorized from time to time by Congress or both and any offense article for any such government or to procure any or all such services by private contract. 
to communicate to any such government any defense information pertaining to any defense article furnished to such government under paragraphs two of this subsection. Five, to be released for export any defense article section of defense disposed of in any way under subsection to any such government. B, term conditions upon which such foreign government receives any aid or fries under subsection A shall be those which the president deems satisfactory. And the benefits to the United States may be payment or repayment in kind or property or any other direct or indirect benefit which the president deems satisfactory. C, after June 30th, 1943, or after the passage of a concurrent resolution by the two houses before June 30th, 1943, which declares that the powers conferred by or pursuant to subject A are no longer necessary to promote defense of the United States, neither the president nor the head of any department or agency shall exercise any of the powers conferred by or pursuant to subject A, except that until July the 1st, 1946, any of such powers may be exercised to the extent necessary to carry out a contract or agreement with such a foreign government made before July the 1st, 1943, or before the passage of such a concurrent resolution, whichever is the earlier. No, D, nothing in this act shall be construed to authorize or to permit the authorization of conveying vessels by naval vessels of the United States. E, nothing in this act shall be construed to authorize or to permit the authorization of entry of any American vessel into a combat area in violation of section three of the Neutrality Act of 1939. <laughs> Section 4, all contracts or agreements made for the dispersal or distribution of any defense article or defense information pursuant to Section 3 shall contain a clause by which the foreign government undertakes that it will not, without the consent of the president, transfer title or to or possession of such defense article or defense information by gift, sale, or otherwise, or permit its use by anyone, not an officer, employer, or agent of such foreign government. <whistles> Fun times. Right then. A, thank you to Greg Salsky for pointing out the DP Essinger, Ellinger for the earlier article. Shumak, that was different. Something, something protectorate, something, uh, yeah, I know. No. Not at all. From a modern viewpoint, that act looks amazingly open-ended. Oh, it was incredibly. <laughs> um, Anderson, I doubt the RN UK would have gone all French, probably gone to government in Canada. That is very true, and that was the RN's plan. But the fear of it as a potential circ uh, a potential thing for what might happen uh, is something which Churchill will milk ha happily. Um, Dan Trim, the US ended up with an empire by accident. Mm, yes. Uh, the RN would probably keep on fighting, but might briefly work with the Germans to burn down the White House for old times' sake first. Yeah. <laughs> Come on, this is so broad as to do whatever the UK needs without anyone being able to do anything. Pretty much. Sure, Max. So in short, the US can give whatever they want to whoever the president wants. Yes, for whatever they want. So Britain doesn't necessarily have to pay for it. Um, Carmen, uh, Sherman, the U.S. have a wonderful way of writing, authorizing amazing levels of authority to someone in a way we wouldn't have a do in Britain. Uh, post absolute monarchy. <laughs> oh, Dan, sometime I will take you through some of the procurement instructions given to various departments in World War Two and World War One, and you will see that they can have quite a lot of authority. Um, Third Sea Lord's powers are amazing in the 1930s. Absolutely amazing. Uh, Anakin, so what part of this act forced the RN to dump Corsairs off the sea at the end of the war? Doesn't feel like giving the hose pipe back. Well, basically, uh, the idea was they didn't have to pay for anything if it had been lost or used, uh, lost or destroyed in the, pro uh, in the conduct of the war. So as, you know, and the Americans didn't want them back and the British didn't want them anymore. Basically, we didn't have to pay for anything which had been lost in the war. So dump it. Um, Jeremy Peter, so POTUS can arbitrarily decide what counts as paying back? Yes. And for the most part, he counted using it to fight the enemy as paying it back. Sure, mate. I, I, I like that they've gone full buff protest too much about sending US warships in the combat zones. Yeah. <laughs> I think there was actually North Wolf, uh, Carl Hammond, one a contract written up where it was one cent per tank at one point. Uh, 
Andrew Campbell, to quote Vernon Bogdan, uh, Bogdan, the prime minister is elected dictator provided they retain the confidence of the house. Very true. British prime minister has enormous powers. This is why size and majorities matter. Because the real restraint on a prime minister is not the opposition, it's their own party. And if their own, enough of their own party rebels against them, that's when they start to lose the confidence of the House and they lose the votes. So that's why prime ministers can be taken down by seemingly small groups of MPs within their own party. A group of MPs just needs to be after the difference plus one. And it carries on. So let's go into the rest of the act. Section 5A. The Secretary of War, the Secretary of the Navy, or the head of any other department or agency of the government involved shall, when any such defense article or defense information is exported, immediately inform the department or agency designated by the President to admit it to Section 6 of the Act of July the 2nd, 1940, of the quantities, character, value, terms of disposition, and destination of the article and information so exported. By the way, I'd just like to point out, Harry Lloyd Hopkins here, the gentleman who said these lovely things about Britain, and it's probably at least half true, is the person put in charge of the administration, the, uh, administering the Lend-Lease program. So yeah, it's not pro-Britain at all. And he's living in the White House, remember? He, the president asks him to stay for dinner, and then offers him a bed for the night, and then he ends up staying in the White House for the next three years. The president from time to time, but no less frequency than once every 90 days, shall transmit to Congress a report of operations under this act, except such information as he deems incompatible with the public interest to disclose. Reports provided for under this subscription, uh, subsection shall be transmitted to the Secretary of the Senate or the Clerk of the House or of Representatives, as the case may be if the Senate or the House of Representatives, as the case may be, is not in session. Section 6. There is hereby authorized to be appropriate, for, appropriated from time to time out of any money in the Treasury not otherwise appropriated, such amounts as may be necessary to carry out the provisions and accomplishment of the purpose of this Act. All money and all property which is converted into money received on Section 3 from any government shall, with the appro approval of the Director of the Budget, revert to the respective appropriation appropriations out of which funds were expended, expended with respect to the defence article or defence information for which it, such consideration is received, and shall be available for the expenditure for the purposes for, uh, for which such the expended funds are appropriated by law during the fiscal year in which such funds are received and the ensuing financial year. But in no event shall any funds so received be available for expenditure after June 30th, 1946. Section 7. The Secretary of War, the Secretary of the Navy, and the Head of the Department of the Agency shall in contracts or agreements for disposal of any defense article, defense information, fully protect the rights of all citizens of the United States who have patent rights in and to any such article or information which is hereby authorized to be disposed of, and the payments collected for royalties of such patents uh, shall be paid to the owners and holders of such patents. Secretary and Section 8. The Secretary of War and of the Navy are hereby authorized to purchase or otherwise acquire arms, ammunition, and implements of the war produced within the jurisdiction of any country to which Section 3 is applicable whenever the President deems such a purchase or acquisition to be necessary in the interest of the defense of the United States. Section 9. The President may, from time to time, promulgate such rules and regulations as may be necessary and proper to carry out any of the provisions of this Act, and he may exercise any for power or authority conferred on him by this Act through such department agency or officer as to be shall, uh, be shall direct. Section 10. Nothing in this Act shall be construed to change existing law relating to the use of the land and naval force of the United States, except insofar as such use relates to their manufacture, procurement, and repair of the defense articles, the communication of information, and other non combat poems enumerated in this Act. Section 11. If any provision of this Act or the supplication of such provision to do any circumstances shall be held invalid, the validity of the remainder of the Act and the applicability of such provisions of other circumstances shall not be affected thereby. Well, um, hello. 
Am I the only one who notices that section six uh, basically says, you know, we said a 1.3 billion limit. Well, if you can find more money elsewhere, you can use it. Dan Freeman, warning, political discussion getting too close to current events. Warning. Hmm. Uh, Shomak, funny, Roosevelt using government bureaucracy to bypass Congress. Where have I heard of that before? Well, you know, in the nicest way, they've actually given permission to too, because they didn't license, because they said, um, such information as he deems, except such information as he deems incompatible with the public interest to disclose. It's, you know, it's brilliant. It's basic. They've written Ch uh, Roosevelt a blank check, and then they've told him that he can decide whether he has to tell them what he spent the money on. Not a wolf. I was wondering how this got passed. I mean, considering the economics politics in Congress, it is rather amazing. But the whole idea was it was going to keep America out of the war. Whole idea they were giving Roosevelt a blank check to stop your America having to get in a war in a Europe involved in a European war. And by the way, it's not just America doing this. Uh, Canada's doing billion dollar gifts to Britain as well, almost every year. Out of him, the good thing Roosevelt never went to Vegas. He'd have ended up buying the place. Uh, Jamie, I guess this paid for the Manhattan Project. This paid for so many things. So, so many things. This also allowed him to purchase Spitfires in the UK and mosquitoes and all sorts of things as the war went on. This was pretty much a blank check and it worked out well for him. Now, here is something interesting I found during my research, and I thought I'd go this again. American Historical Association, um, this is from their website, and it says, what criticism have you made against Lend-Lease? And this is one section at, what is fact and what is fiction? There have been much honest criticism of Lend-Lease. There have also been a crop of rumors, some using and far-fetched, others perhaps aimed at planting seeds of dissension between the Allies. Most persistent of the rumors have centered around butter. As the ration point value of butter rose, the rumors became more extravagant. It was said that we shipped so much, so much butter to the USSR that Soviet soldiers were using it to grease their boots. But actually, the butter that went to the Soviets, the Soviets desperately short in dairy products, was relatively small in volume and was used largely in hospitals. In summer of 1943, a story was being spread in up in New York State about a man who went hunting in the North Woods. He couldn't find any butter in the local stores. When he crossed the border into Canada, however, he could buy two pounds of butter at a time, according to the story. The package is being marked Lend-Lease. This tale had been found to be baseless. No Lend-Lease butter had been shipped to Canada or to any other country except the USSR. Rumors have been recurrent that Len Lease was footing the bill for most uh, for a host of frivolous things, ranging from nylon stockings, scotch whiskey and traveling cases, to gowns for a noted duchess and dinner party in a fashionable Washington hotel for a member of an allied mission. To check on the list of items first, uh, first, all procurement of Len Lease goods and services is made by requisition, and there is no way by which anyone can requisition a dinner party or an evening gown. No request for dinner parties or gowns have ever been made by foreign governments. As for nylon hose, a Sydney, Australian paper in November 1943 reported that American nylon hose would go on sale in local stores. Upon investigation, however, it was found that the story was planted by political opponents of an Australian member of parliament who was up for re-election. It had no foundation in fact and was promptly repudiated by the embarrassed Australian government. 
The allegation that whiskey, traveling cases, and other luxury items were provided on the lend lease had at least a kernel of truth. Such articles were once requested by officers of British battleship being overhauled in an American Navy yard. The officers asked for something customarily supplied in their own Navy yards. Since whiskey and traveling cases are not issued to American personnel, the Navy Department turned down their request. And that full story, the British end up having to send that stuff from Britain. Uh, one story that pops up with usual, uh, usual, unusual persistence is about gasoline. In various relations, and various versions, it relates that American force in the field sold a large amount of gasoline to the British at such and such a price. The price was two cents a gallon, or nine cents a gallon, or thereabouts. Later, the supply situation the spot was reversed, and we had to buy gas from the British. It cost us, sometimes the story says, for the same gas, anywhere between from 36 to 45 cents a gallon. The way exact figures are mentioned in these stories make them sound as if they must be correct. Actually, the alleged prices are the giveaway. The fact is that the United States did not sell gasoline to the British, and the British do not resell it to us. We supply it to them under the lend lease without cost to them, and they supply it to the to its relevant reverse, reverse lend lease without cost to us. Each government keeps records on how much it originally spent for the gasoline, but money never changes hands in lend lease transfers. More sinister was the rumor that the Soviets were trading some of the lend lease planes obtained from us to the Japanese for rubber, and that the planes were being used later, allegedly against our force in the Pacific. Rumors of, these, of this kind, frequently heard on Axis radio broadcasts, have been investigated and found baseless by the State Department and other agencies. To such malicious tales, the truth is a good and sufficient answer, but the truth doesn't always catch up in time to prevent injury to inter and to allied unity. However, there is evidence on the other side too. Many a GI has seen with his own eyes the effect against the enemy of lend these weapons in the hands of Allied fighters, or he may have known from the comforts of eating food and wearing clothes supplied under reverse lend lease. Mm, it's fun. Jane Peter, I want to buy a mosquito. We all do. Dan Freeman, if the government spends money on having things made, then people get paid wages for supplying that stuff. Those people get tax and income. The government gets money. The government spends the money on things. Mm, yeah. Hi, Dev Squad. I'm not late. I definitely didn't miss the notification. Forget it was Thursday. And watch military aviation visualized really good video on why the various World War II Air Forces chose their weapons. Cool. Garmin. To what extent was the act of buy what you want, give it to who you want, and tell us what you want? Just please leave us alone. Uh, there was certainly a strong element in Congress which supported that idea. And from, given parachute silk, uh, silk was a must for the bell of the ball, you just had to choose your dress fabric. Mm. Hi, Night Heron Productions. So as you can see, it's fun. It is fun. Although I would like to point out, it's hot enough in here. I'm actually, you know, warm. Let's check the radio temperature. I don't think I ever expected it to be warm in this room before. So as you all know, I have my fancy spancy radiator which hmm, I enjoyed getting. And combined with the installation in this place and the various other things, really does keep this place warm. Usually I have it running on 16 degrees. You can't really see that. It's not really showing up that well in the light, is it? Um, but it's quite nice. And before anyone asks, yes, I am planning the Admiralty one minute video on the swordfish at some point. Um, for anyone who doesn't know what I'm talking about, on Twitter, I'm going through various Admiralty press releases. How they would, you know, uh, argue something if in front of a press release, if they were doing a press briefing on their decisions in the 1930s. Trent Lanka, Dr. Clark, Australia supplied more to America than the USA supplied was. This was very carefully buried inside the UK lend lease accounts. Actually, not just Australia, New Zealand did as well. 
and New Zealand and Australia both supplied more to America than it was. And, uh, and America then returns it. It's often suggested it's buried in the UK accounts and used to offset the UK. But again, the UK isn't being charged. You have to remember, for Lend-Lease stuff, Britain actually doesn't have to pay it back. There are other loans and other things taken out during the war, which is what Britain ends up paying back after the war. So there are, to an extent, a level of loans, and there are, to an extent, some of things. But Lend-Lease itself is not really paid back. There are, is a loan of a billion, roughly, a uh, long-term loan, billion dollars, at the end to settle the difference in the British accounts on Lend Lease. But let's be honest, compared to the sheer scale of equipment procured for it, a billion is nothing. And it is certainly not offset to using Australian or New Zealand because, believe it or not, Australia, New Zealand, and Canada are all separate signatories of Lend Lease. And one of the interesting things is Lend Lease and Mutual Aid is implemented between all the allies. So all of them are running it like this. Hmm. Javila, some parachutes took uh, took home parachutes. Some paratroopers took home parachutes for their bride's wedding dress. Mm. Off topic. Have you been watching Battleships New Jersey premiers recently? Um, occasionally. See what now? Who ate all the spam? That stuff is expensive now. It is. Right. So. In the UK. What's going in the UK when this is going on? Uh, did we profit by selling off lend lease equipment to the Dominions? No. We didn't need it. We didn't sell it off to the Dominions. We gave it to the Dominions. That's the thing. Again, they had their own lend lease equipment, lend lease uh, things, and there was lend lease going on between all of them because the Dominions were supplying us with stuff and we were supplying them with stuff. It was all done cashless. We've provided a huge, as that's good to point out, we also on, you have to remember on Lend Lease, we provide stuff back and I'll be getting into this but at the end. There is all sorts of things we provide the Americans in terms of basing, infrastructure, support, training, all sorts of things, technologies, developments, everything. And it works out, and as, as I said, it's the, sh the amount of money which goes both ways is significant. <laughs> Jack, so was the situation was the situation like the US buying raw materials from neutrals, food from Argentina, tungsten from Spain, and then giving it to UK by lend lease? Uh, not normally. Uh, honestly, they didn't need they didn't need to. The food, British food mostly came from Canada, not from America, and that was under mutual aid, which was uh, the, uh, the Commonwealth subversion lend lease. Land arm reduction. How does this mean emission being lost? Uh, does it end anything to do with a no debt lend lease in the UK? Uh, we've talked a bit about it. What goods, if any, did the Soviets provide the West? Mainly raw materials, Brent. Mainly raw stuff. Um, some various uh, precious metals. Uh, the Tizid mission had less influence on less lend lease than the Hopkins mission. Um, night Heron production. Garment and parachute. French uh, people would gather them after landing to make stuff from. Mm. Even the Russians sent stuff to US via lend lease. Raw materials mostly. Yes, I said. Trent Lanka. Uh, there is a US civilian demobilization accounts uh, make the specific point. All Australian, Canadian, Kiwi contributions were folded into the UK lend lease accounts. Um, there are various accounts which do. But again, they it, it's, how do I put this? There has been a lot of reimagining of Lend Lease after World War II was over. 
Uh, but if you look at the actual accounts and what was going on, they were separate and they weren't folded into the UK. There were some bits which were transferred over as they were really on the UK expenditure rather than, uh, rather than the Australian uh, or the Canadian or New Zealand because there was common forces quite a hefty amount of integration. So there are some bits like that, which is where the idea comes that that's what happened. But that's not really the case. Dev Squad, US to UK. We heard some crazy stories that the Germans are developing some kind of jet aircraft. UK. Oh, yes. We'd like to see ours. Mm-hmm. Done. Thank you, Carl. Russians sent Cordite to US Army Chemical Warfare Service for flamethrower research. Ooh, it was fun. Matthew Meek. Did the UK not give the US the plans for Gen Engine for free? Yes, they did. Uh, but that's counting to lend lease. Evan, South America was a major source of meat. Battle of the Plate was probably about corn beef supplies. And Bray Bent Austin pies. <laughs> Jeff Beer. Uh, Canada bought US uh, helmets, uh, not used because the British backed out of buying them. Um, safety sacrifice for dubious identification issues. Would have created Canadian identity in battle dress and US helmets. Uh... Not quite. You see, the people who bought the US helmets for the Canadians weren't buying them for the, the army. And they were used. Uh, Night Heron Production, I'm assuming you've talked to the Hopkins mission in this video already? Yes. Right. So, Chancellor of Shaka. Uh, Sir Kingsley Wood, I should like with permission to make a statement under regarding negotiations for a loan in the United States. I'm glad to be able to inform the House that with the approval of the President of the United States, the Reconstruction Finance Corporation has authorized a loan to His Majesty's Government of $425 million, and an agreement was signed yesterday. The first loan is to provide his country with exchange to be used towards paying for war supplies contracted for prior to the en enactment of the Lend-Lease Act. As collateral security for the loan, there will be pledged shares representing direct investments in certain marketable securities. There will be no change in the control or management of these direct investments, including British-owned insurance companies in the United States. The loan will bear interest at the rate of 3% per annum and mature in 15 years, provided that an extension for five years may at our option be made if two-thirds of capital has been repaid at the end of 15 years. The full text of the announcement which is being made today in the United States will be circulated in the official report. The terms of the agreement contained in the white paper will be available at once for the vote office. I believe the House with terms of agreement before them will agree with me that this represents a satisfactory agreement arrangement and once again reflects the readiness of the United States administration to extend their assistance to us. The execution of this agreement will require legislation since the Treasury will need to retain special powers until the loan has been fully repaid, whereas the present Emergency Powers Act will, in ordinary, uh, the ordinary course, lapse before that date. The government intended to ask the House to pass necessary legislation as a matter of urgency. The text of the bill will be available tomorrow, and my right honourable friend, the Prime Minister, authorised me to say that this proposed I'll ask the House to consider it and pass it through all its stages on the fourth sitting today. So, as you can see, it's, there's, got, there's not just Lend-Lease going on, and this is where a lot of the confusion comes in, because there are lots of separate loans, and often I have found historians link it all on the Lend-Lease, and they go, they're paying off this loans, or this debt counts towards this, or this debt counts towards that, and it's not. It's separate. Um, thank you. Thanks, Trent, for that link. The, one of the interesting things is there's a lot more on the American side than there is on the British side in terms of records of lend lease available and easy to get at. But 
some of the American ones, you, the trouble is with Lend-Lease being written so um, wide, uh, widely and loosely, and I think with the change in administration at the end of World War II and some of the things that happened, things get sort of folded in because the trouble is, how do I put this politely? The trouble of it being so loosely interpreted and up to the president means that when the president changes, things can change. There's also this debate in 1942, where Mr. Attlee, as deputy prime minister, adds this. As the House will regulate, the Letting Lease Act provides that terms and conditions upon which any government receives any aid or authorized on the Act shall be those which the President of the United States deems satisfactory. And the benefit in the United States may be payment or repayment in kind of or property or any other direct or indirect benefit which the President deems satisfactory. An agreement between His Majesty's Government and the United States Government has been concluded and was signed yesterday. The preamble to this agreement states that the final determination of the conditions upon which the United Kingdom receives any lease aid and other benefits to be received by the USA in return is deferred until a latter date. This, therefore, is a preliminary agreement. It provides that the USA should continue to supply the United Kingdom with such defense articles, defense services, and defense information as the President shall authorize. Articles and information so supplemented may not be transferred to others by His Majesty's Government without the President's consent. The United Kingdom will continue to contribute to the defense of the United USA and will provide such articles, services, facilities, or information as it may be in a position to supply. Full Congress of such all acts of the United States may be made after the 10th of March 1941 will be taken into final determination of the benefits provided by His Majesty's government to the USA. His Majesty's government will return to USA at the end of the present emergency as determined by the President. Such defense articles transferred under the agreement as shall not have been destroyed, lost, or consumed and as shall be determined by the President to be useful in the defense of the USA or the Western Hemisphere, or to be otherwise of use to the USA in the final determination of the benefit to be provided by the USA in return for the, uh, for the Lend-Lease Aid. The conditions shall be such as not to burden commerce between the two countries, but to promote mutually advantageous economic relations between them, and the betterment of worldwide economic relations. To that end, they shall include provision for agreed action by the USA and the United Kingdom uh, open to participation by all other countries of like mind, directed by the, to the expansion of appropriate international domestic measures of production, employment, and the exchange and consumption of goods, which are the material foundations of the liberty and welfare of all peoples, to the elimination of all forms of discrimination and treatment in international commerce, and to the reduction of tariffs and other trade barriers, and in general to the attainment of all economic objectives set out forth in the Atlantic Charter. At an early convenient date, conversations are to be begun between two governments with a view to determining, in the light of government and economic conditions, the best means of attaining these objectives by their own agreed action and of seeking an agreed action of other like minded governments. The next agreement is contained in a white paper which will be available to ministers later. It's fun. Carl Harman. That makes me think of when the UK sold the Soviets top-end military jet engines post-war and said, you must promise to only use these in civilian planes, and well, yeah. Hmm. Did we sell them top jet engines, though? Uh, or did they just look like they were top jet engines? Hamilton, corned beef is not spam. No, corned beef isn't. It's lovely. Death Squad, reply to results, saying, only equipment that couldn't be returned to be paid for, sent out. Lending war equipment is good, as a good call, a deal, like lending chewing gum. You certainly don't want the same gum back. Mm hmm True. Uh, Anderson, was the UK allowed to transship to the Soviets or the US Army? Um, the UK was sending its own, end to the so uh, own aid to the Soviets. The Americans sent aid to the Soviets separately. Uh, basically, they were both sending aid to the Soviets. Huge amounts of aid to the Soviets. Thank you, Trent, for the next link. Hurricanes were sent to the Soviets, a large number of them, and a huge number of Matilda tanks. We're very generous with our Matilda tanks. They end up almost in many places as sham tanks do. No transferring to others without US agreement. There were some problems with the air supplying exile European forces because some already had separate agreements about financing then stay and supply in the UK. Yeah. It was fun. 
Ah, oh, and more from Len Lease Act. This is from uh, Kenzie Wood. And, um, yeah. Let's go to this paragraph. I do not think anyone still believes that this traffic of land lease is one si is one sided as far as Britain is concerned, or that we receive all and give nothing or little, but all have not a complete conception of what we have in fact accomplished. If we look at the total volume of supplies with which have reached us from North America since the beginning of the war, we have in fact paid for a substantial proportion of them. This country has actually spent some. £1.5 billion pounds in the United States since the outbreak of war on supplies, munitions, and provisions of capital equipment for the Procrustacean of War. Now, we on our side are applying the lend lease principle to all munitions and military supplies and services, including shipping, which we furnish to the United States, Russia, China, and certainly allied European governments as well. Our commercial exports, for which we ask payment here, as I say, have, as, as I say, fallen to a small fraction of the normal figure. The supplies which we contribute in this way to the common task have increased greatly in the last year. The whole conception of the plan does not and is not intended to lend itself to close accounting. The American people have never put the dollar sign in the help that they have given us, and we are not putting the pound sign in the help we give back to them or give to others. Let me illustrate why precisely reckoning uh, besides the mark is beside the mark. Let us first take our great and gallant ally, Russia. On Red Army Day, my right humble friend, Minister of Production, stated that from the beginning of October 1941 to the end of December 1942, we had dispatched to Russia some 3,000 tanks, 2,500 aircraft, 70 million rounds of small arm ammunition, 50,000 tons of precious stocks of rubber. In very round figures, the value, if we sought for a moment to estimate it, of the munitions that we have already given to Russia is about 170 million. More than that, the northern waters on the way to Russia tell the story not only of how British ships and men had taken the cargo safely through, but all the British sunks and British lives lost in our determination, not only to give these supplies, but to get them to Russia. We do not make a balance sheet of items like these any more than we can ever compete, compute in such terms the defence and victory of Stalingrad or the debt we and the whole world owe to Russia for its wonderful and outstanding achievement in the common cause. To other European allies, we are given aid in the same spirit in the same way. We are also giving aid on lend lease terms to China to assist in her stout harder resistance against Japanese aggression. Transport difficulties at present reduce the flow of that aid, but stocks are being steadily accumulated, and as transport improves, they will go forward to play their part in the final and complete destruction of a common enemy, Japan. It is natural that the largest amount of our reciprocal aid goes to the Americans, and that for quite simple reason. The growing American forces who are in this country, who are stationed within the areas for which we are responsible, receive, apart from their pay and from, necessary and from the necessary supplies they bring with them, everything that they ask for which we are able to give as reciprocal aid. Much of this reciprocal aid takes more services, whose value neither they nor we seek to reckon. Who puts a price upon the service we gave them when we took over, largely in our ships, the American Expeditionary Force safely to North America, Africa? Who puts a value on the free access we have gladly given them to all our important war inventions or lessons of experience in the production and supply of war equipment? It may, however, be said, by way of example, that we are spending about $150 million in constructing aerodromes, barracks, hospitals, and other buildings expressly for American use. Mr. Sethenus, the administrator of Len Lease in, in the United States, gave Congress a remarkable inventory of the type of aid we provide to the American forces. And Major Spielberg, the staff member of the Len Lease Administration in London, quoted a vivid figure to show how completely we had tried to provide the American forces in the country of all they wanted. From June to January last, the total expenditure of the American Army authorities in making purchases in this country was no more than £250,000. As Major Spielberg said, this is a drop in the bucket compared with the cost of maintaining an army. All the rest of the articles, equipment, facilities, and services required for the United States forces available in the United Kingdom are procured as reciprocal aid from the British. In the last seven months of the year, from our own resources, we have furnished to the American forces in the United Kingdom a quantity of supplies which would have involved 12 million, uh, 1.2 million tons of shipping, which was more than the Americans themselves shipped to their own troops in the same period. We provided about 1.6 million tons of construction materials and made our own troops in this, uh, made available 700,000 deadweight tons of shipping for American military operations. 
It seems a long time since the Prime Minister, in prophetic utterance, said that we and the Americans would find ourselves greatly mixed up during the war. We are liking and benefiting from the mixture, and we shall continue it. This is the point. There is a lot going both ways. <laughs> Uh, Dirk Squad, again, a lot of the attitude about fighters, uh, British fighters in Russia, and how they're not being suited to the latitude combat in the Eastern Front and all this sort of things come out after World War II. During World War II, they, hurricanes do pretty well. And so do Spitfires. Andrew Campbell, Churchill's and Bren carriers, we offered, uh, we offered Spitfires, but they weren't that keen on them. They preferred Hurricanes. Honestly, the main problem with Spitfires was they were very good interceptors, but very short-legged for Russia. That was far more of a problem. How does a many thousand, does a many thousand square mile aircraft carry cost? Uh, a lot. There's of course it's HMS Victorious, aka USS Robin. Um, FG, the lend lease Act friend to divert all British waterers from Canada to the US. The Hyde Park Declaration protected the American war purchase in Canada for UK distant goods to offset this. Mm. And there was other things as well in Canada. <laughs> One times Mulberry Harbour. Yeah. <laughs> it's a fun thing, basically. And it carries on. There is constant debates about this. And so this produces an interesting thing, actually, the next day. Because Sir Kingsley Wood has talked about it, and then this comes up the next day. Uh, Mr. Richards. Then the Chancellor is holding certificates for an amount which you will take over the course of a year. This is one interesting figure in the budget to which I've already da 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 uh, let's get out of that one. Uh, one of the most important and uh, interesting aspects of the speech of the Chancellor of the Exchequer was the reference to the Lend-Lease Act. We all rejoice, as he finally put it, in the spirit which actuated the passing of that act by the United States of America. And we still further rejoice that the spirit has evidently permeated the dealings of two nations with each other. I only hope that at the end of the war, the same fine spirit will animate the feelings of nations towards one another. We remember the tragic attempts made by this country to calculate and to pay the measure of its debt to the United States of America after the last war. One of the most tragic happenings was during the 25 years which separated two wars. When America got the gold, she did not seem to know what to do with it. I hope this is an indication that we are getting, uh, getting practice in a different kind of attitude towards one another. And if there are debts at the end of the war, I presume there will be some. They will be forgiven and forgotten in the spirit of which the Chancellor of Exchequer spoke, and that we shall be able to start unencumbered by the experiences we had in 1918 and 1939. Now, I doubt that's going to, that's doubtful of thinking, but it's interesting to point out, as the Chancellor said in his earlier speech, most of the debts Britain accumulates in World War II are for the period before Lend Lease is actually implemented. So you think, how much longer did that take to pay off and all that sort of thing? That's all accumulated before Lend-Lease is implemented. <laughs> hmm. Um, uh, Dope Squad, the Hurricane was more easily adapted. In fact, some of the anti-tank Hurricanes were pretty darn useful on the Eastern Front and in uh, the North African campaign. Russia to recommend the better reckon the best land lease supplies they receive were US trucks. Serious upgrade of logistics. Yep, US logistics, uh, US trucks and British trucks were critical to the Russians.
Jack Ray, financing the First World War by Hugh Strachan was very revealing. I wonder if there's an equivalent of World War II. Um, there are a couple of equivalents, but none is quite as good as Hugh's book. I think he's doing another one on World War II. I think Hugh is doing one on World War II. I seem to remember him talking about it at a conference. So, the results. Dun, dun, dun. What happens? What are the results of all this work? Well, here's Russia and what Russia's getting from America alone. Now, here is the thing. When you start to realize that the Arctic convoys are about a quarter of the supplies going there, you start to realize the Pacific War is a big thing that the go, going up the Persian route uh, per, uh, through Persia, that matters. Uh, you start to really sort of think of, ooh. And then there's the, I, 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 I love that 452,000 tons. Uh, well, yeah, goes that way. It, 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 there's a huge amount of supplies being moved. A lot and lot of supplies. And a lot of steam engines. And here are our percentages, though, and this is what I want to sort of. Now, I haven't included all the countries which benefited from um, lend lease here. So, values of material supplied to the US uh, by the US to its allied nations. British Empire. And that includes Canada, Australia, the whole of the empire, India, the lot. $31 billion, roughly, or 64.86% of the total. Soviet Union. Nearly 11 billion, so we're going to say that's 22.7% of the total. France, they get the sign of the devil, apparently, with 6.66%. Um, China, 3.36%. Greece, that other country named at the beginning, 0.17%. Woohoo! There's even Poland there, 0.03%. And by the way, there are far more countries and they make up the remaining 0.6%, 0.06% of the total. Yeah. <clears throat> Which countries did well out of the lend lease? There's God. Could push about 300 kilometers from their railheads because of the Studebakers. Allowed the Russians to exploit their breakthroughs much more than the Germans could. Yeah, the Germans never were that much organized. Yeah, as I said, France was 6.6%, uh, 6.6%, 3.223 uh, billion. Peru was an ally. Yes, they got involved in World War II and got lonely support. It's always nice to have allies. It is. Now, this is from USA to people under lend lease schemes. This is their supplies to people. Interesting enough, when you find and try and hunt down the statistics for the British, it's slightly more complicated to find out. The British do explain, seem to be engaging in a lot of accountancy, uh, more accountancy work. But also you can understand that because quite a lot of the British is stuff in kind. Darius Rudowski, Poland got less than Peru. Yes. That's another thing. Were the supply, supplies of Poland, the resistance seems a bit high, or the free Polish forces seems a bit low. Free Polish forces, mainly because here's the thing. 
Who supplied most of the equipment to the free Polish forces? It was mostly British equipment. So it was a British account. This is an account of how much American equipment and American supplies and American raw materials goes to these people. <coughs> so you have to remember, this is only the bill from America put into Lend-Lease. Then there's the bill from Britain. And uh, from Britain alone, it's reckoned that Lend-Lease to the United States accounts for about 16 billion. And there are various other fingers which go around once you get in the British Empire going to America. So it's, there's a lot of money going around. And the 16 billion is one figure I've read where it's estimated. And I'm, I'll, I'll sort of, I think it's a bit higher than that because they don't include some of the things and that the Britain are doing on behalf of it. That's good. Apparently, it just said Mosquito wasn't so good for the U-boat. The 57mm gun jammed if it's subject to maneuvering, say, in approaching U-boat. Rockets were much better by all counts. They were pretty good. Dan Freeman, uh, the UK, uh, well, uh, USA, well, uh, Turkey wasn't in the war, but they were not above using Lend-Lease to bribe them to stay out the war. Death Squad, uh, the Peru didn't join it as late as the others did. <sighs> no, no, others joined it later. And then. And this is from O'Schreiber, from, uh, from the Australian Quarterly. The extent and ramifications of Lend-Lease were tremendous. President Truman's report to Congress on January 9th, 1950, showed that more than a $50,000 million, or $50 billion, uh, worth of arms and goods had been turned over by the US to her allies and friendly nations. 39 of them in all. Mr. Sumner Wells, U.S. wartime Under Secretary of State, says that at the Tehran conference at the end of 1942, Stalin declared that except for the American production, the war would have been lost. Russia, after becoming involved in the war involuntarily, received enormous quantities of equipment from the U.S. and U.K., thousands of British lives being lost in their transport. The U.S. supplied the Soviet with 15,000 planes, 70,000 tanks, 135,000 machine guns, 363,000 trucks, 32,000 ambulance wagons, 52,000 jeeps, 343,000 tons of explosive, 15 million pairs of army boots, 3.5 million tons of steel and other metals, much else on a big scale. Mr. Stregitz, administrator of Lend-Lease, reported, UK Lend-Lease the Soviets thousands of planes, tanks, and other supplies. As regards reverse lend lease, nearly $8,000 million worth, or $8 billion worth, was provided to US forces by her allies. On this sum, nearly 90% came from the British Empire. Russia's reverse lend lease has been extremely small, notwithstanding her undertaking under the agreement signed on June 6, 1942, to return to US at the termination of emergency such defense articles as should not have been destroyed, lost, or consumed. In contrast to Russia's attitude, Roosevelt said of Britain, the expenditures made of the, by the British Commonwealth nations for reverse and lease and the expansion of this program emphasizes the contribution the UK and the British colonies has made while taking its place on the battlefronts. The British pooled their resources with us. The reciprocal contribution of UK was amazing in its character and volume. Many outstanding inventions and much British-made equipment were supplied to US and our allies. British leadership in radar, the Bailey Bridge, and in other directions have been generally acknowledged. That's the point. That's the real point about Lend-Lease. Lend-Lease is about not just deleting the dollar sign, but deleting the pound sign, the ruble sign, everything on allied transactions. You supply what you can to what you need where you can supply it. You know, that turkey has given me ideas about interesting topic of the channel area. Financing, you know, uh, uh, UNRWA, between Lend-Lease and the Marshall Plan. Hmm. Jane Plater, 
Did any smaller countries declare war on the Third Reich so they could upgrade their military on the cheap through lend lease? Of course not. Uh, Night Heron Productions. Produ Mozzie's rocket arm was the equivalent to a broadside of six inch cruiser. Rather scary package in one aircraft. That's why I'm so interested in the sea mosquito concept. <laughs> it would have been fun at an earlier time. Basically, the idea is. You do, uh, you're giving what you can. Lend-lease in that regard is, and I would argue, very much about winning the war. It's very much about supplies and winning the war. It's not about... <sighs> It's not about getting rich, it's about winning the war. And in many ways it's a revulsion of what Wilson had done in the First World War, where he basically set huge loans and, especially on Britain, had tried to force them to pay it back. Uh, it, it, it's what caused so many issues in the 1920s and 1930s between Britain and America and arguably what caused it to take so long for Britain and America to start working together in the late 1930s. And as pointed out, and at the end of the same trend, as Trent has just added, the UK also turned over lots of licenses to produce British high technologies to the US without dollar payment and as part of the lend lease protocols. Yeah, huge amounts of the, the ideas. Well, basically, the, Mos the sea mosquito would really have worked uh, and would have probably been in existence in World War II if those Admiral class carriers had been built. And I said they're big enough, you're going to end up with twin engine aircraft of them. Jamie Peter, well, there's a comedy sketch in the concept of a mosquito built by IKEA. That would be fun. I wonder if we could get uh, uh, kind of if we could get IKEA to build some mosquitoes. I'd add one onto the roof. Hmm. So. Summary, and you really thought there was going to be anything other than a Hellcat there? Did you really? Lend-lease. I don't know. Lend-lease is one of those issues. It's one of those areas. Um, hmm. Fun. Light colored t-shirts and a warm day, a warm day after being a warm March shed after being in cold uh, in the cold outside all day. It's fun, I know. You have to start thinking through lend lease not as necessarily an economic transaction, but more a strategic transaction. Because that's in many ways what they're approaching it. Arsenal democracy concept. Um, and the thing is, certain things couldn't have happened without it. I mean, British, the fleet air arm Hellcats wouldn't have happened. Wildcats were picked up off a French order. I mean, paid for, but Hellcats wouldn't have. They didn't have the money. They were running out of the dollars. It would have had to depend what Britain could build itself. Mm, which would have been interesting. Trent Lincoln. The issue with the public's knowledge of lend lease importance in World War II found us on the rocks of whether the general public knows anything about history at all. That is a different conversation. I think usually it found us on the rock that people are easy. It's easier to see a thing. I. It's easier to look at this aircraft 
and see it and go, oh, that's a product of Unleash. It's far more difficult to go, there's a plan. There's the, there's the technology. There's the skill. That value is far more difficult to place a value on. This is one of the reasons why the British, a lot of the British stuff going into the Allied and into Lend Lease is technology. It is research. It is development. It's what Britain's been working on for the interwar years. And it causes the Americans some fun, especially the whole concept of water as armor. Um, that's good. If I recall correctly, one of the largest single line items in all Lend Lease was high octane fuel for aviation both to the UK and the Soviets. Yes, it was. Because... Hmm. Adam Flynn, thought it'd be a Corsair, not a Hellcat. Trolling Jamie? I always liked the Hellcat. I'm sorry. As lovely as the Corsair is, um, I would always pick Hellcat. Mainly because I like to be able to see where I'm landing. And just because you have gold wings doesn't make you pretty, uh, doesn't make you more pretty. The Hellcat is literally a big engine, and if you ever go to town next to them, and I have at Duxford, I've got this wonderful picture of me a few years ago, and they had the Wildcat sitting next to the Hellcat, and they were literally both wings, uh, their wings folded, so sitting as close as they could sit, and there's a picture of me standing between the two of them going. And my friend who was with me who took a photo of Leslie was going, you look the happiest I've ever seen you. I was all going, yeah. Got a wildcat, hellcat, wildcat, hellcat, wildcat, hellcat, wildcat, hellcat, wildcat, hellcat. <laughs> I'm hoping next time I finally get that, they'll let me sit in one of them. They've been holding that over my head for a while. Um... Dan Freeman, I have a soft spot for the Hellcat. First FX model I made. Lucky you. My first one was a swordfish. That was surprisingly complicated. Trent Lanko, Cornell Barnett's deeply forward 1986 book, The Audit of War, The Illusion of Realities of Britain and Realities of Britain as a Great Power, has a lot of information on how Lend Lease made British heavy bomber and radar uh, production possible in terms of tooling aluminium and vacuum tubes. Enough to make it worth skim reading over Barnett's diatribes on UK practical man industrial, industrial practices. Uh, I would say there is a lot more flaw in that book than you necessarily think. I would start as um, tooling aluminium and vac uh, vacuum troops. Yeah, there is a lot more. Go uh, that that book is flawed in many, many, many ways. It's an interesting analysis, but it uh, it, it doesn't do more than a surface research in a lot of things, as it says, comes up with the practical man practice. Usually, uh, the, my advice is usually if you find a book which has something which is quite so strange that, but the rest seems to accord with your understanding, you might want to check further into the quality of information supporting the stuff which accords your understanding. And in that one, that's in the case. No, sometimes. Often it's okay, but that one is interesting. Aviation Empire. Uh, Corsair and Nelcat had the same engine, if I recall. Variations on it. Uh, doo -doo 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 -doo. Carmen, it's much easier to refine fuel when you're not being bombed. Yes. To be fair, there's that case, and there's also the fact that the British high octane fuel is mostly comes from. Uh, the Middle East, and that's mostly going to Australia, being chipped to India, Australia, to supply the American forces operating in the Pacific. It makes things easier. Otherwise, the Americans would have to be shifting a lot of fuel that way uh, in dangerous areas, and the British would be having to shift fuel both ways. <laughs> Uh, 
enchantment. I seriously need to go down on sites but last covered. Uh, one of the interesting things is um, in COVID, as a, whenever it's allowed to be open, Duxford is open and it's one of the easy ones to go around in COVID. It's a nice wide open airfield space. So as long as you don't mind putting a mask on, you can get around the, you know, the hangars quite easily as well. There is all one way. Downtrain, although, no, that's just, although really I suppose the Avengers should be called the pa Black Panther, no. Come on, I've told you I do model making, but don't have the patience. It does build up your patience. Jane Peter, what's the second model of this one by any chance? No, my second model was um, HMS Belfast, which was also interestingly complicated. And probably gonna need to get a new one of those because the let's put us way the six seven year old me painting wasn't that great. Uh, Man six forty, you might appreciate the story. I was nine and I and we were uh, we're at an air show at Jacksonville Naval Station. The Blue Angels were supposed to be there, and my mum lost track of me. Okay, where's this going? <laughs> That's good. Re sea mosquito. Take the PBJ B twenty five airframe. Put fourteen fifty cals in those. Add two thousand pounds of bombs and rockets. Ouch. Um, nighttime productions. If you had to pin them down, what would you say were America's greatest gains from Britain in the lease? If covered already, just say so. I'll watch the video from uh, straight later. Um, <sighs> radar basing HMS Victorious. AKA US as Robin. The, and it, how do I put this? The biggest advantage of Lend Lease and Mutual Aid within the Allies is it removes a huge number of points of potential friction. It stops anyone worrying about the cost of what they're doing and just means they're going to do whatever the best thing is. So it's your greatest advantage you can possibly do is then lease because it removes a lot of the grounds of fighting. If we consider now current NATO operations and current stuff in Afghanistan and Iraq and all those things, the amount of arguments that have been going on over the various cost of munitions and who's paying for what and da 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 da. Because you don't have it in place. You don't have those options. Trent Lane, the best Lend Lease book I found is Walter S. Dunn's 1995 The Soviet Economy and the Red Army, 1930-1945, with a completely statistically detailed chapter on Lend Lease. Hmm, that's cool. Um, I have a book which is quite a recent publication somewhere called The Economy of World War II, I think. At least that's its subtitle. And it has all the statistics and looks it all over. I can't find it now. Melanie 1640, continue. I'm sure if there's a picture, but when she finally spotted me again, I was climbing from the wing to the fuselage and into the open cockpit of a Luftwaffe's Panvia tornado. Okay, Melanie. Now, I, I think your mum might have been a little bit worried about that point. Come, the issue is getting there. I don't drive. That is the problem. Trent Lanka and has integrated to the lend lease contributions in other chapters as well. Required. Mm, cool. Anvan, or just ship the oil north from Iran to Baku for the Soviets. They did. Where do you think the British oil for the Soviets came from? Trent Lanka, Dr. Clark, most writers on lend lease missed the idea of macroeconomic specialization of labor and how US lend lease promoted the British and the Soviet economies to focus on weapons production to the exclusion of more basic industries. Mm, there's that, and there's other things it helps with as well. Mm. I don't production. I've been scratch building models over the lockdown. Been working on a 1700 Belfast, but had to restart. I had the. Restart. I had the measurements for the four, uh, for the front spurs, front spurs, and back spurs, only by millimeters, but it's noticeable. 
It was a painful lesson, impatient. Ouch, out only by me. Ow, that's painful. We never trust Soviet statistics. That's true. I recall a nice bright yellow handle with black stripes around it between the le my legs on the seat. <laughs> okay, Melanie. <laughs> oh. oh, that's that's not a good time. That's that that's primo panic time for parent. Mm. <sighs> that is primo panic time. <laughs> All right. We hope that was disarmed, Greg. We hope. Jane Peter, anyone else think Dr. Clark would make an awesome model making video? Well, I've got some models actually my mum has bought me for my new office. At some point, they might get made as part of the new office series once I finish off the woodwork and I put in the um, iron brew wall. So what have we got coming up? We have got a history of armor and amphibious warfare on Sunday. We've got patron 19, second tier powers, dreadnought procurement and construction, Spain, Austria, South Hungary, South America, Greece, and the Ottomans. 21st of March, we have Bruchets 42, some more sci-fi. Uh, 25th of March, we have Patron 20, Sino-Japanese War of 1894, Naval and Land Operations, Fighting a Modern War with Feudal Societies. That's Jeff Beeler's suggestion. Uh, 26th of March, we have Armchair Admirals, Battle of Matapan. 2nd of April, Minotaur and Tide Class Cruisers. Uh, we also, I should point out that the votes for Patron uh, suggestions will be going live on Sunday. So if you've got suggestions of topics, you need to have made them on the patron uh, on the option on the thing by Sunday. Again, a little bit longer this week because this month because I'm still deciding on the suggestions for the office name when I'm going to put that vote up for it. I had been going to do it first, but I'm deciding I'm going to wait a bit longer on that. Mainly because I know at least three people are mulling suggestions and I want to give them time to put their ideas in. And 26th March, Armchair Animals, Battle of Matapan, which we're hoping Jamie's going to be joining us on. 2nd of April, Minotaur and Tiger Class Cruisers. Woohoo! Um, 4th of April, Bruce Ships 43, Aircraft Carriers and Naval Aviation. Well, hey. 9th of April, the Battle of Saints. Well, actually, that will be literally the 9th of April was when the Battle of Saints began. It goes to the 9th of the 11th of April, so. It seemed appropriate, and um, technically, Bruchitz 44 is going to be something medieval, but it might be something Age of Sail, or I'm, I'm, I'm still debating on that one. Long patrols we've got coming up. We've got Lend Lease Act, which will be coming out next week, so this will be this this presentation, but it'll be in, like I've done the Crown Colonies, it'll be longer. Uh, Minotaur class cruisers, 23rd of March. 30th of March, Tiger class cruisers, and the 6th of April, Monitors of the Royal Navy, Section 3, and 13th of April, K class submarines. So that's what we've got to come up. And now this is a point where I normally say, any questions, anyone? Um, American land lease was incredibly important giving the UK and the Soviets the air power they produced in that basic industrial inputs like aluminium machine tooling, vacuum tubes, and 100, 150 octane fuel. I would say the fuel, yes, aluminium, quite a lot of Britain's comes from Canada. Quite a lot does. The Americans often take credit for it, but there's a huge amount which comes from Canada, and quite a lot of the American aluminium is used for something else as well. Uh, and then, Iranian railways still run, uh, run north to south. They are looking to start building east west. Chinese economy. Yeah. Of course, it was supposed to be disarmed. Hoping for some model railway making videos too. Yes, they're going to be that. Um, Belt Squad. A model railway scale version of was Belfast, the centerpiece of the layout. I was thinking more about a tribal class destroyer because I can get one of those on N-gauge scale. Um... I didn't really spend any time searching for uh, remove before flight flags on it. I was more interested in t uh, taking in all of the instruments and controls all around the cockpit. 
I'm glad you're having fun. And your poor mum was probably having a heart attack. Um, kind of repeating my humble offer for Austro-Hungarian procurement. Anything for the Adriatic? I know. That will be there. Um, meanwhile, my earliest memory is riding inside an APC in Devon and climbing inside an IFV of either Scimitar or Scorpion or Warrior. I was seven. I had a school face and being told the boom button. Mm -hmm. Hmm. Yeah, Trent Lanka, the expansion of RAF LNS F would from two to nine squadrons of 1944 would have been economically impossible for the UK without then lease. Hmm. My message for you. I didn't suspect I'd be getting another opportunity at least anytime soon to look around the copy of any torpedo, let alone one in active Lufthansa service. No, you wouldn't have. But that was good fun. And the Tiger was the second RN ship went on. Rossi was the fir uh, first. Ooh, cool. That's got Battle of Malapan. When Warspite decided that HMS Revenge couldn't be allowed to be the only sneaky battleship. Hmm. When they said for it, yay, K class, yay, yes. That is thanks to Melanie's popular demand. James Peter, was a special a major part of our mutual aid with Canada? Sadly. <laughs> I know, production. Thank you for the talk. There was always fun and engaging. Wish I had someone your caliber in my secondary school would have picked history over art if you were teaching. Yeah, I have. I, I work for a company called Justin Craig, which does uh, A level and GCC revision courses. I'm usually a course director these days, but sometimes I do do teaching um, still. And the amount of students who, when I'm teaching them, turn around and say, You know, you're the first history teacher we've had who's got a degree in history. I'm sort of going, mm, That worries me. We all like the idea of a tribal model in whatever model railway scale. <laughs> oh. There's got, I think, quite a lot of US aluminium came from Canada too. The US has fairly limited bauxite supplies, imported a lot from Brazil as well. Yeah. Um, I think it was Revenge which did the bombardment of Cherbourg while it was being bombed. And there, there are a few other Royal Navy ships which do some interesting little activities in World War II. Carmen, I know it wasn't the activated, it was an active military unit base near my hometown. <laughs> it's always fun when you have a base. No, 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 Slavic. I don't remember. There was a model set of HMS Ark Roll and HMS Eskimo by Revol in 1700. Yes. A fun set to have. Uh, I have to say that's the biggest what if, I think, of World War II. Is uh, of the interwar build up, is if they built the second Ark Royal, if they'd ordered two Ark Royals at the same time. Would have been an interesting scenario for Britain. They put it off, and they waited a bit longer. And then they get the illustrious class. And again, with the illustrious class, if we had pushed for a bit more tonnage, and you're talking three or 4,000 more tons per carrier, so significant, but not massively significant, in the scheme of things, when you consider what Ark Royal was allowed to be, you could well have seen a difference in them as well. An extra squadron, perhaps which would have made a difference in World War II performance because they'd have probably had two squadrons of fighters and two squadrons of attack aircraft as their standard fit. And then you go into, let's say, in their training campaign, you've got 24 fighters at the beginning and you've got the supplies for them and 24 attack aircraft. 
and that makes Illustrious a very different thing to fight. Because you can do a lot more with 24 than you can do with 12. Paul Karachan, a history class usually suffer from teachers for just throwing massive dates at people and giving manners of out-of-context information, which they then dumb down to nothing in order to explain. No, there are many, many good history teachers out there. Um, my girlfriend, before she did her PhD, was a school history teacher, and she was a frank she's a frankly amazing. So there are many good history teachers, and there is ways to teach it, but there are also sometimes people who just literally read out the books, and I that's I think because they don't have the training or possibly training for it, or possibly they're just tired. Because history is one of those subjects which really <laughs> does require the teacher to have energy and be enthusiastic. It's kind of like maths and English. Whereas with science, um, I would say with chemistry and physics, you can make things blow up and go bang and move across, which will excite people anyway. With subjects which are quite dry, you have to inject that enthusiasm. It's not going to generate itself until someone's interested in it, and they're only going to be interested in it if you give them the enthusiasm to begin with. Uh, my travel is going to protect my engines on the coastline because they're going to be Great Western. If a German one appears, it might shell it. Uh, an armor and amphibious warfare is me and we back with Falklands as well. Cool. Uh, I learned more in one of these broadcasts than I ever did in standard grade history. That's what I'm for. Thank you, Jeremy Peter. Come on, I was over 40 when I finally got a MiG 21 combat. My nephew urged me to go to the SUU shop. I told him, I've waited 40 years for this. You are not getting me out. Karen, <laughs> uh. I believe my teacher, Mr. Jones, frankly, was qualified by our Open University. They have very good degree courses. I like the Open University. Hello, you kids. And Flint, yes, instead of Ark Royal, we had to build aircraft maintenance ships. We had to build aviation support ships because of where we're going to operate in the world. They're just recently infrastructure. That's half of the costs in World War II are building infrastructure in places to support these things. You can't just take tanks and planes. It's one of the interesting things that Churchill finds out. One of the least mobile organizations in World War II are strategic bomber squadrons. Why? Because the level of infrastructure required to maintain and support a strategic bomber squadron is immense. They need to have it built up for them to before they can go. And they need to have the facilities there to supply them when they're there. So as whilst they have this wonderful operating range from their base, which look, is really, really impressive, you actually have to have the base. And the base, therefore, becomes the thing that's the target. And it, it gets interesting. If you had the Audacious class or something similar built instead of the Illustrious class, how many more carriers would the RN have had into the 60s, assuming they hadn't all been worn out by then? Oh, a few more. Dr. you could hear them all the time. My grandma was living a mile from the airfield. Cool. When I I got a bit of a scare this day. Somewhere while drinking the other night, I ended up finding a way to set a password on my phone that restricts raising the volume. Discovered it earlier today. <laughs> Well, you... that just sounds cruel. That's got the other issue with teaching history is that uh, curriculum is so stuffed full, the teachers don't have time to do anything but rush through the book. It makes it really boring. Mm -hmm. Which is one reason why I have so much fun when I am teaching it, because uh, let's put it this way when you're doing a revision course, you've got, let's say, for A level history. Um, with Justin Craig, you've got four days with a class of six students. And they're sitting and looking and going, How are you gonna are you gonna cover the whole of two years of history in four year four days? And I'm sort of going, Yes, and guess what? None of you have done the same modules. So you I'm actually gonna be doing about twelve uh, going to be doing because there's eighteen modules in here. And I'm still gonna get it done. And the end of four days they're going, How did that happen? 
because history is all connected and you can teach pretty much any history if you know how it connects and relates to other history at the same time. So I can be teaching three or four modules at the same time if I play it smart. <laughs> And the thing, history doesn't repeat, it's just that people don't listen to historians, so they have to repeat themselves. <laughs> There's the old joke, Histori uh, those who um, study history are doomed to watch those who don't repeat it. Dan Freeman, Shh, everyone, I'm trying to work out when the RN could lay down another arc or similar uh, due to the treaties expiring or dumping other hulls. Ooh, so much possibility. Literally, they could have laid down another arc in the same year. There was a space in one of the yards. They looked at it. Vickers. On the time. No, second. It wasn't what I typically use for a pin. And the only way to remove it is resetting the phone, which I can't do for a moment or so. <sighs> Good luck. Come, do you have a 143 or 150 model? If not, you're getting a, a TF1 <laughs> if they're ever made. Um, <laughs> Animal 1633365. Greetings from America. Greetings to America. Ooh. Yeah. Yeah. Enthusiasm teaching is a two way thing. That's why chat is giving so much to this live. I see this now with remote teaching. Talking to silent initials is pumping out happiness out. It's pumping out happiness out. Yeah. Death Squad. Uh, Re strategic bomb squadrons. The UK had Avgas pipelines supplying the bomb bases. It meant they couldn't be easily rebased as you need to build new pipeline space. Yes, and the reason they had those they had those pipelines was because actually supplying with enough fuel by truck would have completely collapsed the British road network. Or you'd have to build in whole new railway lines. It was easier to build a pipeline system. Still do have the same pipeline system running across the whole country. Dandring, what is this logistics nonsense? Stop boring me with such minor details. Rommel, shortly before losing in North Africa. And in France. No, he for it. Regarding history teacher school, I was walking past one who had his door open during class. No clue where I was going why. But I had them discussing an oddball American Revolution incident that I had come across via the History Channel, back when it actually was the History Channel, and would have never expected to have been discussed in high school. Made a point to come back and talk to that teacher after school, and discovered they exclusively draw, uh, taught AP and IB history courses, so I had zero chance of getting in one of their classes. That's a shame. That is a shame. Hmm. Carmen, I've been hearing jets overhead recently, but I don't know which ones are overhead due to clouds, but I know it's either a typhoon or a French one. Are you sure it's not the Hawks? Because they've been doing a lot of work in various parts of the west, west of the UK recently. Come, me teaching geography class how to read a map. 30 minutes before exam, then how are you going to teach us it will be if we were trying for two weeks and we boom, boom, boom. Hmm. Yeah. Man, this is true. In uh, the roots of those pipelines were highly classified. They still are, and they still exist. But if you go walking in certain parts of the country and you know what other uh, what certain signs mean, you can soon find them. <laughs> uh, Dev Scott to supply airfields and airports and air bases. You just have to know where to wander. There's Scott. Yeah, so I'm not sure the fact he just knew he was the bottom of the list of reinforcements and supplies, so had to attack quickly and win or lose. Didn't really have a choice of what to do. Mm, yeah, but even when he did have supplies, he tend to not have it with him and forget where it was. Brent Polis, my history teacher didn't believe me when I told him there was a draft in the American Civil War. I had to give him sources. Ouch. Hmm. 
Hmm, that's good. Carmen, my history teacher used to teach stuff on module and off to add the context. That's cool. That's a good way to do it. German, I recommend Flight Radar 24. RF jets have often working transponders and are marked on map. Hmm. No secret order. What? You mean someone's going to mark the ones with call before digging and such? Pretty much there are some signs. And it basically, if you are going to build a housing development in certain areas, and if you start digging without checking what those signs are meaning, that's a good way to get a lot of very, very um, interesting people turning up and checking on you and going, excuse me, have you got planning permission for this? And what are you doing? And I'm east of the country has a ton of kit, uh, a ton of kit overhead. Uh, can tell by noise. Hmm. Trainers always fly the most. They do, uh, Dan. Um. Ouch, Carl. Yeah. Right then, everyone. Um, I'm gonna say I'm going to finish this in a few minutes because I'm hungry and I fancy tea. And I need to pack up my office and move inside. So let's say I will keep this going f till about 10 o'clock. So about another 14 minutes. OK. Dan Freeman, Dirt Squad, Dan Freeman. So many machines are in front. Even when supplies are available, they can't get to the railway station and no further. Nazi logistics in general were terrible. They were. They were. This is one of the things when I find when people start telling me and I was having this um, very interesting debate in oh, some, some in online conference I ended up actually turning up to. I, was, I, I meant to avoid it, and then I clicked on the link and was there. And um, someone was sitting there going, these gem destroyers were the best destroyers in World War II. And I was sitting there looking and going, those destroyers were all sunk in Narvik. They are the best destroyers in World War II because they have this engine design and this design and da 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 da. I go. Da, 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 da. So I ask question again. But weren't all those destroyers sunk? Yes, but none of the Allied destroyers were as good as them. But they were all sunk by Allied destroyers. Only when, uh, only when they were caught and couldn't outmaneuver them. And. Could they outmaneuver the Allied destroyers? Couldn't the tribal class, etc., go faster than them? Well, yes, but that's merely the tribal class. So you're meaning the Royal Navy's anti destroyer destroyers could outmaneuver them, outgun them, and outfight them, but you're still claiming they're the best destroyers? Yes, they are, because look at their refined engineering. Look at these carefully balanced plans. Look at these things. All these refinements which are in here, whereas the British one is, you know, it's these 4.7-inch guns which are just so common in the Royal Navy. There's nothing special about them. It's this, it's that. And I'm sitting there listening to him going, um, I can stay here and listen to this, or I can get on with my life and drink some Iron Brew. Why must I pack my office up? Well, because I take the laptop in with me, into the home with me, and I do things like move this and put this down off its stand, because at some point the desk, the actual proper desk is coming in here. Trent Lincoln, my history teacher didn't believe me. There were, I caught Tom, there was a draft in the Americas of War. Uh, Oi, there was this thing called the New York Dra City Draft Riots. Yep. German, for example, there is now Osprey and Special C-130 in northeast of uh, Cambridge. Cool. Avalon, sadly not so with transformers. That's a good view over the moors, and we'll see. Not even the Swiss Hornets had it on. Cool. Oh, sad. <laughs> Thank you, Jane Peter. Oh, it's a pleasure. Uh, 
Animal 1635. They were the best destroyers of turning artificial reefs. They were lovely. And they, they also turned into artificial things sitting on top of the beaches quite a lot. That's what you found an uh, academic webu. Uh, there are them. <sighs> if you want to see someone who has real fun with them, um, uh, there is a uh, PhD student called Victoria Taylor on Twitter. Uh, Spitfire at Spitfire Philly is a tagline. And she picks them up everywhere. I mean, I don't know how many of them jump out on her and try and tell her about her PhD topic, which is the not, something to do with the notification of the Luftwaffe and various other things. But she really, really knows her stuff. And you just sort of watch them and going, you are going to get shot down. Do not get involved. Don't. Don't go and take this person on. It's like the amount of times people... This is what I love. There are areas of history which I admit I have to go and do research on before I'm going to present a lecture or talk about, because I'm not the strongest then. There are areas in history which I my knowledge comes mostly from books. But there are some areas of history where my knowledge comes almost entirely, because the books I've read are lovely, but entirely is based in primary source material, people's accounts and all the documents and the various things I've synthesized over the years. You do not want to argue with a historian who's got that kind of knowledge, because we have depth to our argument. A lot of depth. And it's the kind of depth which is going to so soak up your points in seconds and going to keep coming back and roll over you. Not because we're egotistical, not because we're aggressive, but literally because we've been studying it, in my case, my, uh, there are some the areas I've been studying, since I was about 12 years old. So that's more than two decades. It's a depth. <laughs> mm -hmm. That room. The person that really destroys sounds like an idiot. The biggest issue is always is the human factor, and the Iron Tribal crews sound like they were special. Well, again, I would point you to the little one-minute video I did about the Tribal class um, last night on Twitter. I think you will enjoy it. There is a whole list of videos, and there's going to be one more coming on Swordfish, and there's going to be probably one on the Fairy Fulmar at some point, and various other things. Maybe more precisely, Kriegsboo? Possibly. Speaking of teachers, I had one once uh, was telling us about how a speech had been given. We shall fight on the beaches. We shall fight on landing grounds. Ah, uh, yes. I remember worrying a bit about seeing an AH-64 sitting by the M3 as I was worried I might, might have been a speaking gun attached. <laughs> that would be quite cool. <laughs> and a patch of a speed gun. <sighs> mm -hmm. And how had it been given by Franklin Roosevelt? Melanie, that's worrying. And when, usually you know when there is a, t a tanker tracking out at sea and an AWAX out over the Vale, York. Ooh. That's good, but where booze don't believe that anyone knows more than them, especially a woman. Don't get me started on that. Again, my colleagues are excellent, male or female. They know, and I will add this, or whatever these days. Um, I have to say that the, the one trouble with me is I, I really don't. They are all good academics, and they all know their topics, and frankly, I don't care about any of the rest. If other people try and make that about or make that their focus of their de dealing with them, I find that rude. When you're in the room as an academic teaching, what matters is up here and the ability to communicate. Everything else is secondary. It's your personal life, and that's you.
So I spoke up, told her the speech was not given by Roosevelt. I was told I was wrong. I tried to tell her not only was it not given the SDR, speech was given before the US entered the war. Oh, this doesn't sound right. The rest of the class started jumping and telling me off, and that of course the teacher knew what she was talking about, was told I need to stop because it was SDR and she knew what she was talking about. So after class, I went to her office and asked her to please Google it. Her reply was that she didn't need to, as she was correct, and I need to drop it. I finally told her when, where, and by whom the speech. Ooh, this could be fun. Had been given, and she was like, oh my god, why didn't you say that in class? <laughs> um, Darren, how is a ship class that was sunk the best in the world, and how does the gun being common make it bad? If it's common, it's usually good gun, like you... Uh, don't get me started, okay? Do not get me started. Seriously, some of the things that people come with, they... Uh, okay, you're reading off the statistics of how it performed in, the siege, in trials. This is how the gun performed in trials. Now, if Trent's watching, Trent Blenko, he will tell you, and he's a specialist in procurement and done all those sort of things, that if some, a gun can perform in trials, but that's under trials conditions. How it performs in actual operations can depend on the whole range of context factors, which might not be as replicated the same as in trials. So how a gun performs when you're on land firing it sensibly versus how it's performing when the ship's moving is very different. And this is one of the reasons why the Royal Navy goes for rapid fire and the slightly smaller guns, because guess what? If you can fire more shells faster, you can compensate for that movement slightly easier and got more chance of hitting. That's what I see. The mistake you're making here is that Webu's will read your argument, take it on board, and rather than start yelling that you're wrong because Webu. Hmm. Come, if there are a woman, that's likely that it would be the old you're woman, you can't know nothing argument. Yeah, every time I hear that, I really, really hate that argument. It's the most silly argument known to mankind. That's good. Uh, they're all good argument academics, other than the, the German who thinks that the German DDs were good. He might be good argument, but not in naval history. Yeah. Ugh. And he has the te tenured teaching post. Anyway. Not a wolf. Well, Melly, just well. Yeah, I know. Come on. I'm open. I know, I know a decent amount, but I'm not the best. I don't know everything. Yeah, none of us know everything. Not even I know everything. Drack in a fell might know everything, but he's keeping under wraps. Like, excuse me, how was I supposed to do that when I've been told I needed to drop the issue as I didn't know what I was talking about? Yeah, never got an answer. Uh, you never got an answer to that. You never wouldn't leave. Nor did she ever tell the class that she'd been wrong. Yeah, that takes a lot of... Mm. Silliest argument I've ever heard. Oh, there are lots of them. There's the one that the Royal Navy doesn't understand naval aviation because its aircraft are all multi-seaters, and you sit there and go, so, uh, what does, is the Royal Navy thinking about doing long-range strikes at night? Do you agree with that? After all, there is Taranto. Yes. Okay. So if you're launching a long-range strike at night, how are you going to navigate? And fly. Well, they do it at the end of war. No, no, they don't. They can do it at the end of war, but they have beacons and they have radar and they have various things which can assist them. They don't have those things at the beginning of World War Two. So, how are you going to do it in 1939? Uh, you're probably going to have to have someone in the second seat doing navigation for you. And oh, by the way, at the end of the war, when they do do it, they tend to do it with their navigation lights on, and they have, as a leader of the group of fighters, which might be doing it, a multi-seat, it's a multi-seat aircraft, which do have navigators in them. Uh, 
And that's the reason why, after that, if you look, consider the aircraft which come out post World War II, the jet aircraft, wearing technology is getting a lot better, are two seater aircraft. So many of them, there's the CVIX, and anything which is supposed to operate at night tends to have a second person in them because of navigation. Uh. That's good. He was reading the sales material to the conference. Yep. Darius Rosansky, the DDs that deserve the title, their ship class as a submarine moving <laughs> from underwater in the north. <laughs> nah, it's with all respect, an old ball. Drac is lovely. And that is the shot. Drac is a very good friend. And he would probably say the same thing about me. We are both equally geeky. Um. When he comes over and helps, it, basically he and my book collection are very are getting very intimately acquainted. Right, I think I'm just about uh, yeah, I'm at three and a half hours, so I'm gonna end this soon. <laughs> Who knows if those Jim DD Signies ended up like most of the French sh age of sail ships? I are insane. Uh, the clock might have been convinced. Ah uh, no, the RN really wouldn't have bothered them. They'd have probably been persuaded to have to have them, but then to try and keep those engines going? Oh, God, and their range. Oh, fuel consumption. Oh, good Lord. Oh. I had to upgrade their entire electronics for starters because they weren't salt water viable, really. Uh, yeah, no, no. Um, I had an angle with a teacher over how to spell doomsday and was told it's actually doomsday. Yet in the English secretary, it's doomsday. And I was told, no, you're wrong. It's wrong be quiet sit down ah, don't worry these things happen right <clears throat> this squad even a single seat of daytime fight usn fighters either operate inside of the carrier's cap or alongside multi-seat aircraft that have navigators yes Fuel consumption what? The German destroyers. Right then. Thank you very much, and everyone. I am going to have to call it a night because I have to go get some food. I'm starving. Um, I hope you've had a nice time. Thank you to Melanie. Thank you to Dan. Thank you to Stafford. Thank you to Derp. Thank you to Darius, Alistair, Carl, Kyle. Um, thank you to Animal. Thank you to Ad Adam. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Anuk. Uh, thank you, DGB40. Thank you, Aviator Enterprise. Thank you, Peter Dawson. Um, thank you, Trent Lenko. Especially thank you, Trent, for all those links you've been posting up. That's been really cool. And thank you, everyone. I, I, have, I hope you have a nice evening, and thank you very much for watching. Thank you, Jamie Peter. Thank you, Jess P. I know you've gone already, but you're going to watch this later, so I will say thank you to Jess P at the end. Uh, thank you, Paul Johnson. Um, thank you. And thank you, Grace Salsky. And thank you, everyone. Take care. And have a nice evening. Matthias Slavic, thank you. And Nikas, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone. And uh, as I said, I hope you have a good time. I um, thank you to everyone who does the super chats. Thank you to everyone who does watches. And thank you to everyone who likes or presses the subscribe or the little bell down below. Thank you to everyone's patron. Thank you to everyone who's on Discord. It's all really, really fun. And thank you. You've made lockdown a lot more bearable and a lot more fun for me. And I hope I've made it a little bit better for you. And just be safe and be happy. Thank you very much, everyone. Take care.